Or is our second favorite John Connor game? Yeah, yeah Ash Connor. Uh, what's the biggest thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.
There's a meeting here. Where is he? 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 Thank you. 
Well, 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 Harry. Great, good to see good you. To see you, my friend. Oh, that's not Gary, is it? Michael. It's been too long, my friend. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. Hey, man. Michael. Michael. Good Michael. to see you. How are you? Kim. Kim. The team's back again. Let's make some TV. Yo. You boys. Yes, let's make some television. Welcome. Welcome to a very special television production, television coverage. Wherever you're watching, in Australia, across the country, or maybe across the world, whether you're in South America, North America, Asia, Europe, or even the United Kingdom, we welcome you for this very special presentation where we clash heads. We combine our minds and try and work out what is wrong with the game that we love, the game of football. Welcome to... Everybody's united in the beautiful game. My name is Mike Tomolaris, and uh, as you saw there, I normally ride a bike, but for those of you who may not be old enough to remember, I do have a football background as well. Um, I'm a former journalist and uh, covered the World Cups, uh, football, FIFA World Cups in the 1990s, as well as the European Football Championships in England in 1996, commentated in the National Soccer League, and I guess uh, my uh, claim to fame, as far as I'm concerned, was in 2005 when Australia, the Socceroos, qualified for the World Cup uh, for the first time in 32 years. And that was a memorable occasion in November of 2005 when uh, we overcame, Australia overcame Uruguay and we made it to Germany in 2006. Well, over the next three hours, we're talking football. I'm uh, presenting the first of three hours. Later on in the production, we'll be joined by George Danikian and also Andrew Pascalides. And we've got a panel of guests, a panel of guests who know the game. They've got history. And let me tell you, there's a lot of history in uh, the world game in this country, Australia. In fact, it's the centenary since the Socceroos first, uh, well, first took to the football field against New Zealand. That was in 1922. A hundred years of history. But where has the game come from? Where is the game going? That's the big question we're asking. We're asking you at home. And... Incidentally, wherever you're watching in Australia or around the world, we're asking you to contact us. Send us a message. You might be watching on YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook. Send us a message. Tell us where you're watching from. And perhaps you can throw some questions to our panel. In the next 60 minutes, I've got uh, three incredible people with me, three football heads and three people who have been involved in the game for many, many years. First up, it's Benita Messiatis, who is a, a writer, a football writer, a, uh, a publisher, and I guess uh, more famously or infamously, a whistleblower of the beautiful game in Australia. Alongside Benita, we have uh, a former Socceroo who played in the early 1990s. Uh, Ita Gensch, these days, is a uh, football manager for the National Premier League in New South Wales and is the top dog at St George City in uh, the National Premier League. And alongside Ita is Warren Mundine an advocate for Indigenous affairs, but has got a lot of history when it comes to Australian football, dating back to the early 1960s. The boy from Grafton has come good <laughs> and uh, has, knows his football, and we're going to tackle a lot of issues over the next hour here, and as I say, over the next three hours with George Danikian and Andrew Pascalides. So, what is wrong with the world game? I'll throw that question first to Benita Merciatis. Benita. What's wrong with the game and how can it be fixed? A can general I, question, but yeah. an important one. Can I start by acknowledging the people of the Kamaragal Nation on whose traditional lands we meet and acknowledge their elders past, present and future? So I just want to do that. What's wrong with the game? Uh, I think um, one of the first things would be is we have very high expectations of it. And um, I, I think we, the world is so much closer now um, and there's so many other forces and so many other things that are in play um, that we have such high expectations and those expectations are not being met. Um, so it's a question, it's an issue of whether we need to change those um, or, or whether, in fact, the game needs to come up to meet those expectations. And, you know, they're big issues, they're weighty issues, they involve a lot of expense, they involve, involve a lot of resources, and I'm talking about 
things around off the field more than on the field, which ATEC and others are, are much more expert on. But that would be my very brief answer to that question. The game of football is enjoyed in most parts of the world. It's the number one sport, the number one game in probably 98% of the world's population. Two countries, three countries that I can think of off the top of my head where it's not played as the number one sport is the United States, New Zealand, maybe four countries, South Africa and Australia. Why is it, ITEC, that Australia doesn't enjoy a game that's so idolised everywhere else in the world? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think the fact that, you know, when you compare it to the Rugby League and you compare it to AFL where, you know, they profess to be, you know, world champions at... Um, we, we're probably not that at the moment. Um, we're a developing country. I think there's a lot wrong with Australian football at the moment, but there's also a lot right with it as well. Um, I think sometimes we look back on the old NSL days and, and even before that, um, the Phillips Soccer League and so on. Um, but I think we have come a long way. Um, but there are inherent problems, in my opinion, around um, the relationship and the harmony between everything that happens from grassroots right through to the MPL representative space up into the A-League. And um, I think there's always been criticism around the neglect around um, past clubs and the ethnic-based clubs in the old National League and where they sit in the landscape. So we need to somehow unite all those fac factors and um, all those people into, into one. So we've got clear pathways and... Um, a clear direction for the game, which I don't think we have. Warren, I'd like to know more about your background. You've, uh, you're from Grafton on the north coast of New South Wales, but I would imagine that uh, not many of us know that uh, you started your career uh, as a player uh, of a different game. Tell us about your history. Well, yeah, it was. It was I played rugby league because we're in the bush. That's what we did. We, we played rugby league. I was a South Grafton boy and uh, at the Rebels and then we moved to Sydney in 1963 and I remember in, at school uh, this kid came up to me um, and he said to me, Steve Bilby was his name and he said, you look like you'd make a good left half, you'd, you know, would you like to play soccer and I've never heard of the game and so I said what's a left half and what's soccer <laughs> and, uh, and anyway he was a pretty convincing bloke, he got me to come down to Mona Park Air in Auburn, and because that's where we moved to, uh, Auburn was a very, uh, very much a uh, uh, you know football town, uh, you know, and it was very strong because of all the migrants that were there. Mm -hmm. And so I went down to Mona Park, and I signed up, and I was playing in the old Granville District competition with uh, uh, with St John's, and then I went on to Auburn District and Auburn in those in those days, and it was to me it was. A really a game changer for me for my life because as an Aboriginal kid coming down from the bush I only knew two cultures it was a black culture or a white culture and then coming to Sydney and I sat in a classroom with something like 40 other kids I went to a St John's Catholic school there and and there was about 30 nationalities in that class there were Italians and there were Lebanese and there was a, a whole wide range of other people in that and and, and they introduced me to the game and for the, probably the first time in my life I felt like I was welcomed, uh, that they treated me uh, as a human being, as just as equal as they were and, uh, and, it, was, uh, and it was really fun because they used to ask me, they said, where do you come from? And I said, oh, well, I come from Grafton and they'd go, no, but where do you really come from? And I said, well, I'm Aboriginal and then they'd say, well... You're the real Australian. You're not like them other people. You know, you are the real Australian. And so that made me feel really fantastic and really good. And I, I have mates from those days, which are still my mates now, 100, 100 years later, and we still catch up and that. But yeah, it was so welcoming and it was such a great, uh, a great experience for me. Yeah. Mm. Well, tell us about uh, the development of uh, Aboriginal players in Australia. I mean, perhaps the most famous uh, is Harry Williams, who was the first Aboriginal to represent the Socceroos back in the early 1970s. And when you look at the other football codes, whether it be AFL or NRL, uh, those codes are dominated by Aboriginal players. And from my experience, I've been to the Outback, I've been to the Northern Territory, and I've seen the way these young kids under the age of 11 years of age kick the Sharon around. They have so much fantastic skill. They kick the Sharon like Maradona would, would juggle a spherical ball. Why is it that the AFL and uh, the NRL, uh, which is also dominated by um, uh, Indigenous players, 
Um, why is it that they tap into that market? Is it a market that the soccer or the football fraternity hasn't really touched properly? Well, look, when you, when you go back to those periods, you go back to the 1960s, I remember meeting John Moriarty and, um, uh, and Charlie Perkins. Now, Charlie Perkins is, is a living legend in regard to civil rights for Aboriginal people, you know, Indigenous people. And he, he was a football player. Now, you know, he, you know, he played in Adelaide and he, and he played for Pan Hellenic, you know, the old Pan Hellenic club, and he was a, a legend. And, and, and then you had John Moriarty, who was the first Aboriginal to, uh, to be picked for the uh, Socceroos, but because we got uh, banned by FIFA, he didn't get the, the play. But, uh, and, yet we, and we had all these people coming through, and Rugby League and AFL in those days, or VFL, whatever it was called then, they weren't very welcoming for Aboriginal people. It was, uh, it, you really had to fight through racism, you really had to fight through a whole range of other things. While in, in football, we, we were treated really well. In fact, you know, I have a great memory of going to a friend of mine's place. He was an Italian and, and uh, being a 13-year-old uh, a kid and, and they were serving red wine with the meal and I thought, gee, these people are pretty cool, and, uh, <laughs> which probably explains my drinking habit later. But, it's, uh, it's, it, 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 but what they did was they learnt. The AFL and, 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 and the uh, Rugby League, you know, you look at a person like Artie Beetson, right, in the 1960s he come down from, uh, from Queensland and played in Sydney. He's a living legend. In Rugby Every, League. Yeah. yeah, in Rugby League he's a living legend. What have we done for people like Harry, Harry Williams? Mm. What have we done with Charles Perkins and stuff like that? Mm. Uh, so uh, we, left, we lost a big opportunity. Uh, the way they structured the game, and Benita, I'm glad you're here, because we worked together in getting the, the National Indigenous Championship moving those years ago, and, and you drew up a 10-year plan, and that just went out the window. And so we missed a great opportunity to, to do what the uh, AFL and, and uh, the Rugby League were doing. Do you agree with that, Benita? Uh, look, I, I think part of the issue has always been about money. I mentioned it in the mm. outset. It's about resources. Um, it's not necessarily a lack of goodwill. And to, to, you know, to use the example that Warren just gave of back in 2008, that's right, John, John Moriarty, <coughs> Warren and myself internally within Football Federation Australia at that time drew up a 10-year strategy. We'd uh, for Indigenous participation and to increase it. And we drew up um, the idea of having national Indigenous championships. Were, was that strategy perfect? Probably not, but it was a start and there was resources going behind it. I have to say, though, um, I know that the resources going behind it were some, a somewhat cynical use of resources because it was about being able to tick a box with FIFA at the time over the World Cup bid. So... You know, when all of that started to go awry, uh, then it was pretty easy just to drop off the whole idea mm. of Indigenous participation. So there's been, there was a gap there for some time, which was picked up in part by the Moriarty Foundation, which mm. is, you know, their whole business model is around that. But it needs to be, you know, today, here we are in 2022, um, it needs to be much broader. It needs to take in the whole of Australia. And, you know, we, do we have the resources to compete with AFL and the NRL, for example, in, the, in Central Australia or in South Australia, etc. No, we don't. So we have to be smarter about mm. it somehow. You got and, some, yeah. Have you got some, some thoughts on that, uh, ITEC? Yeah, I think um, well, we certainly need to embrace it. I think you've got to go back to the history of the game and acknowledge, you know, uh, people from the past and their contribution to the game and obviously uh, different groups of people in society and how we're going to... Um, attach resources to that, and Benita made a good point about resourcing. And I think essentially the problem with football in Australia is that uh, we don't have the bottom, or sorry, the top-down funding models that can help um, drive those initiatives, uh, whether it be Indigenous football championships and, and whatever else, down, right down to the grassroots uh, levels of football. So um, when you don't have top-down uh, funding, um, you're essentially compromising what you can deliver, and that's essentially the problem with the game here. It's all, it's all bottom up in terms of um, you know, user pays and so on and so forth. So without those resources that these other codes have, we can't really compete at that level. And um, then that leads to other conversations around where we are as a nation. And um, 
you know, you look at um, the resources put into the game in Japan and Korea and North Korea, even Malaysia, where you know I, I spent five years there playing, and the amount of money they pump into the game now is just phenomenal compared to what we do. I mean, you had a Malaysian under under twenty three squad who were based on the Gold Coast for six months, who played in the uh, Queensland State League or the NPL full time, and um, Scott Older and Shaw, ex Socceroo, Brad Maloney, ex Socceroo, were there with them, living with them full time. And I don't know how many of you guys knew that, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's a type of resourcing that these countries put forth that we can't have. And then we talk about um, the game's problems. Um, you know, we talk about the Socceroos, we talk about, about every other team, that, you know, the way we're going in the, um, with the, um, you know, the young Socceroos and uh, Joeys and so on and so forth. You need resources, you need coaches, you need camps, you need tours, you need, you need everything. So. We've got a live studio audience uh, over the next three hours uh, and they're here with us uh, tonight, tonight here in Eastern Australia. Where are you watching from? Let us know. Are you watching from other parts of the world? Communicate with us through the uh, social media platforms. We're very interested to hear from you wherever you're watching and uh, send us a note. Ask us a question. Ask the panel a question, a question or two, if you like, over the next two or three hours. And uh, in the live studio audience, well, some very familiar faces, including... Bertie Mariani, who's, had a, who's played a major role as a coach of the old National Soccer League and uh, these days uh, looking very resplendent uh, with that goatee of his. But uh, Bertie, uh, if I could ask you, is it possible to ask Bertie, uh, what do you make of the discussion so far? Always interesting. When you talk about the game and you get people like the three panellists and everybody else here, it's always interesting to see the perspectives. Um, there's no simple solution. I've always maintained that. Uh, you know, people like to look for a little switch or one particular thing to pin on, but it's a very complex issue and has spanned a, a long period of time. So I, I, I agree with all of them, but I think it's a, a combination of a lot of factors that um, need to be addressed. And uh, the critical factor is who's addressing them. Uh, and I've always... and I. I put a post down this week, which I don't usually do, but it was a, a situation where a friend of mine, an ex socceroo uh, Paul Degney, always said, look, you can have plans as much as you like, but in the end it all relies on the people that, it have, that you give the responsibility to implement them. And I think that is the case where the game is the game. It's a beautiful game. It's been described as that. But I think it, uh, it, the, the complexity of how we are, the history, I mean, you talk about the rugby league and the AFL, where it's come from. Uh, if you want to question, well, how did Australian Rules, Rugby League and Let's Go Rugby Union progress from the mother country who actually invented, mm. if you believe it, invented football? So mm. how didn't that get there? So there's a lot of questions that you ask that need to be answered, and it's a historical one as much as a complex one now. Many, many faceted things. Mm. Well, that's an interesting argument there, Benita. Have you got something to say regarding Verdi's comments? Well, I think it gets back to what I said at the outset. It's about expectations. And I think for too long we've had an expectation that because the rusted-on supporters who are here to tonight and who are maybe watching, for the us, it's the number one game. We expect that everyone else should feel the same, and they don't. Australia's got 25 million people and growing. Um, you only have to look at the other sports to know that they, you know, they, are, in, they are constantly in the ascendancy. And yet over the years, and this gets back to that idea of strategy, we have alternatively tried to be the number one sport. I don't think we should try to be the number one sport. I think, you know, the PFA back in 2007 or 2006 perhaps, they said we should try to be the number two sport in every state. And if you go through each state, Queensland Rugby League, number two soccer. New South Wales Rugby League, number three, number two football. Um, and that wasn't a bad positioning. Instead of this switch which we had, I have to say, under CEOs within Football Australia who had come from other sports who wanted to be number one, I think we should perhaps look at being content at being number two in terms of the issues around viewership and uh, uh, not so much participation. Participation is a completely different issue. But those issues around the professional aspect of the game, if we're number two, we're doing pretty well. We're sitting pretty well. In terms of participation, we're number one, almost by good luck. 
rather than good management. What do you mean by that? Well, I, we've been number one as a participation sport. I'm talking five to 14 year olds for something like three decades. Um, and that hasn't been because we've particularly done anything wonderful in terms of attracting young people. Anyone who's a mum in this room, and this is another problem the game has, I suspect I'm the only mum in this room, uh, will know that kids are, you know, it, it's easy to put kids into football. And what we need to do is to keep doing that, getting kids playing football and hoping that as they come through their life cycle, whether they end up being professional players or marketing people or medical specialists or running the Macquarie Bank, that they maintain their love for football because that's how we in improve the that's how we build the culture of the game through getting it through every part of our society. So I think if on the one hand we looked at something such as being the number two sport in every state mm. and being content with that and then continuing to grow participation through various strategies and getting back to resources and the whole bottom-up thing. You know, I, I have called it in the past a great big player tax. Something like $10 million of the revenue that goes to Football Australia comes from um, players who play the game. Whereas in AFL or NRL, the money goes down and, and the money, you know, that's why you see Sharon's in Central Australia and you don't see f footballs. So, so iTech, this is where I drag you into it, being involved in uh, grassroots football. Are we doing it the wrong way around? Oh, OK, so this is a long conversation around, <laughs> but what are we going to... Um, We've got, got three, three hours. hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, grassroots football, if, you, if you're a parent and you want your child to play a sport, generally it'll be football, unless you're playing cricket in the off-season. And it's safe. I mean, if my, I would, would not want my child to play rugby league because it's a, it's a robust sport where they could get injured. Um, that sort of also applies to AFL, um, so it's safe. Our participation rates are through the roof, and we're going really well. The emergence of female football has been incredible. Mm. I mean, how do we convert those people into supporters of NPL and A-League? And that's really the question. Um, so to do that, I mean, it's just bemusing how... You know, Brisbane Raw could have a great run in the A League and get 40,000 people at a game, and all of a sudden, for a regular season game, they're not, they're not going so well, they'll get 5,000. And, um, you know, people want winners. So it gets back to how do we convert that? I know that the A League clubs are trying hard in that space to engage and get, you know, Sydney FC with their junior blues programs and so on and so forth. Uh, they're going to be regular, regular consumers. They've got to go to the games. And, um, um, the other thing is you, you bring a guy like Del Piero over here and um, I think Sydney FC's um, average crowds went from like 13 and a half to 22. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've got the star power. Uh, there was a recent game against Barcelona. It was 80, over 80,000 mm -hmm. people at um, Acor Stadium. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's interest, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the, uh, the key people in the governing bodies need to understand how do we do that. Uh, even back in our day, back in the old National League, I was part of... Um, the Coca-Cola development officer, myself and Tommy McCulloch and a few of us used to go all over the New South Wales, regional New South Wales. And um, I, know, I know we have social media nowadays, but we'd hand out stickers and posters and, and engage person to person. Nowadays, it's all online. Um, it's not personable. It's, um, it's a bit different. Um, so they're the challenges and um, understanding pathways and, um, and, and so on and so forth. Are we doing a great job in that space? We're probably not. But um, once again, that's part of the unification process. How do we get grassroots clubs attached to their MPL clubs? We can get them out of that into those SAP programs, skill acquisition, um, into NPL and, and onto an A-League club. They, that, that's the challenge. Warren, um, ITEC uh, mentioned the star power, and we did have star power when uh, Del Piero came to Australia, but you're involved with the Western Sydney Wanderers, or you were, mm. uh, at a time just after uh, Shinji Ono came here, and he was a star yeah. that uh, pulled huge crowds to Parramatta Stadium. Uh, tell us about your memories of that era and uh, the fact that, uh, well, that was history from recent history that really hasn't been repeated. Well, well that's one of the sad things I know because when I was on the board, and it wasn't just me, it was other people. <laughs> it was, and, and we set up a culture 
you know, a, a tribal culture, because that's what football clubs are about. It's that tribal culture. Mm -hmm. We were Western Sydney. I'm an old Auburn boy. All, uh, the, uh, we had people on that board and people through the system who were passionate about Western Sydney. And we saw, and that's what brought the crowds in. In fact, we had, and, we, and you had the, you know, the RBB and that. I, t I used to take friends of mine who were rugby league and rugby union people to the games. And after that game, they'd signed up as members. Because they were, ca because our game is about not only the players on the field, it is about the crowd, the fan. Mm. They work together in, in Eunice. And, and that's what was happening at Western Sydney Wanderers. And one of, one of the sad things I had, we, you know, we had games at the uh, Olympic Stadium, you know, the Accor Stadium, uh, where Sydney had the derby games with Sydney FC and Western Sydney Wanderers, and we'd get 40,000. Yes. Yeah. So, 40, so, so the last one, we hardly got anyone there. So why <laughs> is that? Why has the game deteriorated in terms of crowds? In the last yeah, a lot, uh, of it's based, a lot of it down to performance, right? Oh, what, what do people want? They want a winning team. The standard yeah. is I mean, still there. I, though. I was at the uh, Sydney Football Stadium, Sydney FC versus Wanderers a few years yeah. back. Pop, Popper was coaching, and um, there was forty thousand people there, and there was probably another five thousand people who didn't have a seat. So I don't know how they got in, but it was just crazy, yeah. right? And I remember some of our St George City kids were the halftime entertainment on the field and so on. We couldn't sit anywhere. It was that crazy. So that, that was at a time when the Wanderers were winning. So, yes. but, uh, that's, that's part of the problem. Winning shouldn't be everything. If you're building an actual club culture, whether you win or lose is unimportant. You go there because you love your club. And this is where I think part, part of the issue that the A-League has at the moment in particular, and we'll focus on the A-League, but of course it's relevant to the NPL to a lesser extent, is that they're trying to be one size fits all. And there are all sorts of different supporters. There are supporters who are there for the club come hell or high water. It doesn't matter if they win or lose, they will be there. Then there are those who will go there because it's a fashionable thing to do. Um, and every, it's, everybody's talking about it and let's go and watch a match. Um, then there are those who may go to see a football superstar, um, such as Del Piero. I mean, Australia has had football superstars since the 1960s. Um, people who have been involved in the NSL will know there's been lots of football superstars. Mm. We recently published a book about it. Um, you know, Tell us about the book. Be, <laughs> it's called Be My Guest, Football Superstars in Australia, which tracks a whole range of players who came to this country. Harry Michaels brought many to Wollongong Wolves. Um, some of them have had a fantastic impact. Some of them have had no impact. But that gets back to about it's not one size fits all. You have to look at what connects... The, the fan to your club and to your team. And there's one more um, complexity that is around today that there wasn't back in 1977, or two more, actually. One is... That's when the N NSL began. Is yeah. that what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, that's when the NSL began. One is the fact, and we only had to see the paper today, where the TED Network expressed disappointment at the ratings for the A-League. Um, and if... You know, if we don't get those ratings up, there will be not any sort of TV deal next time. So it's absolutely critically important. We not only need people coming into the game to watch the game live, we need people, we need eyeballs on TV. Mm. And then you've got the social media crowd. And, you know, that's really only about 30 to 35% of the population, but they are loud, they are passionate, they are, they are opinionated, they are vociferous. Um, and so those three things have to be juggled for each of the A-League clubs and the A-League and the A-League overall. Well, let's talk about television in just a moment. You touched on a, on a point that interests me, and that is the fact that uh, in most parts of the world, the big leagues of the world, whether it be England, Spain, Germany, France, uh, whether your club's coming first or last, there's always a full house. It doesn't happen here in Australia, and I think it may be the mentality of Australians. If your team's not winning or performing, then... Uh, What's the point of watching the game? ITEC, is this where relegation and promotion should come into play? Yeah. There's nothing to play for if you're coming last or nothing to lose if you're coming last and, at the and, A-League. And that's what drives crowds. Drama, you need promotion, relegation. Absolutely. Um, without it, uh, like I, I watch the A-League and um, it's round 18 or round 20. Seriously, there's teams not playing for anything. It doesn't interest me. Um, obviously, at the top end, you've got a couple of powerhouse clubs, like Melbourne City, for instance, 
Um, you know they're going to kind of be up there anyway because of the amount of money they spend on players. So where's the interest? There's no relegation, which gets back to that drama and dynamic that you see in the English Premier League. And we saw that with the EPL. You know, um, the drama associated with that last, you know, t- eight to ten weeks of the EPL with Everton on the verge of getting relegated, you know, and who's going to get promoted. That sort of drama has to exist in the game for us to thrive and to keep the interest up. But Everton's also a club that's been around since the 1880s. So there's much more culture. There is much more depth of feeling. I mean, there's whole generations of families who were born to be an Evertonian. So we don't have that. Um, And that's... That's what all of us have a responsibility to, to build and to, to develop. doesn't matter what we do or what our role is in the game, whether we are the most opinionated person on social media or whether we are working in the ALEG or whether we are sitting in this room, it's part of trying to develop that culture because, as you said earlier, Mike, our, our Socceroos played their first game on the 17th of June 1922, the first international in 17th of June 1922, um, the first game is recorded perhaps as being in, in Tasmania in 1859, but at least in 1880 in Sydney. So we have this proud, rich, deep history for white Australia in this country, and yet we're still struggling about it being our culture mm. um, and being able to build the culture and develop it. Let's just uh, continue the conversation about promotion and relegation. It happens in most leagues of the world. Warren, what's your view on that? I think it's. I think promotion and relegation does fit into those cl- those clubs who are, who are who could drop down or could or come up. It actually does drive it. I had friends of mine who played rugby league in England, and and they had promotion and relegation. And those games were just as exciting and just as passionate as the teams who were fighting for the for the championship. And that, that plays a, 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 an important role for the competition. And so, I, I, look, I'm a, a big supporter of promotion and relegation. Uh, I think it, it does give passion. But the game, but any sport, and, and it is something I, I noticed with, with Australians, that if you're a winner, then you get crowds every week and that. But, uh, but at the same time, we've still got to build this culture of passion about the game. You know, like, I'm passionate about the game because of what it did to me in my life. And, and, and you, it's, you meet other Aboriginal people who, who played in the game and, that, and they're passionate about the game, you know, because how we were treated, how we were welcomed and were brought into the, into the game. And, became, and it was more welcoming than rugby league and, and AFL in my, in, in, in my, t- my time than, than those sports. And, and yet we didn't seem to... I, I don't know what it is. We, we, every time we get a good go, we seem to mess it up a little bit. <laughs> Look, it's one thing saying, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. Let's have promotion and relegation. But is it, financially, is it financially feasible? I take your team, St George uh, City. Uh, they're playing Wollongong United in the Australia Cup. Victory over the Illawarra Club and uh, you guys, your team, is in the final national competition of 32. Yeah. You'll be up against possibly... Uh, Melbourne Victory, playing at a small little boutique stadium at Penshurst Park. So mm. is it feasibly, uh, financially feasible for a club like St George, for example, to play with the big boys in the A-League? You know, we, we started the club about um, six and a half years ago and I remember saying to people then that we're gonna, we had to win NPL 4 and get promoted to NPL 3 and we had to try and win NPL 2, NPL 1 and then we'd tell all the players that we're going to go to A-League and eventually we're going to play in the Bundesliga. <laughs> and that was our joke, right? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, without, yeah. without ambition and aspiration, without the romance of having a club go from the bottom to the top, wh- what are we playing the game for, really? In the end, I, I just find that I find the A-League is good. I, I like the stand. I think the stand is OK. Mm-hmm. I think the grounds are beautiful. The TV coverage is nice. Um, there's no drama. For me, there's not enough. And what it doesn't do, it doesn't open the door to the romance of a club coming from the bottom up to the top. Sure, you've got to meet criteria. Sure, you've got to have a region that you can attract supporters from. But so what? That's the mm. beauty of the game. And, um, and if you can't get promoted because you don't have the funding, well, you can't get promoted, but at least it's there. I, I mean, that, to get to your question about whether it's financially feasible, I, I can't answer for St George City, but, you know, that's part of what the AAFC, the Association of Australian Football Clubs, has been looking at now since 2017, so that's five years. Um, what are the essential criteria necessary to be able to have a functioning and 
sustainable national second division. My understanding is, and I, I think Football Australia people will be here later today, but you know, my understanding is they're close to some sort of arrangement regarding that. I hope they're not going to go for state-based national, state-based state level uh, uh, promotion and relegation and, and say that's some sort of national thing. But, you know, you've then got to look at it from the side of the A-League clubs. For right or for wrong, they signed up to an agreement that gave them uh, certainty within a certain competition until, I think, 2032 or 2034. Um, so maybe we have to be creative and look at promotion before relegation. That's assuming that the clubs coming up um, can actually meet the um, financial commitments that are required to, to be at that high level. And then you've also got to balance the issue that I raised earlier of viewership. I, I can only stress, if we do not improve of the 86,000 average per game that the A-League had last season, we won't have another TV deal. Not, not, a, not another TV deal the way we know it. I mean, the whole TV situation might change from then. So we have to be doing, regardless of what some individuals think of the A-League, and I know some people hate it with a passion, um, but we really all, as a game, if we're going to be united for the beautiful game, we all have to be supporting as much as possible um, the viewership of that competition. And without that, without that happening, without money coming into the game, we may as well be whistling Dixie. Well, that's where the television comes into it. And uh, currently, the deal with the Football Australia is uh, one live match on free-to-air television. Um, and you've got, uh, what, uh, five other games on uh, live streaming on uh, subscription TV. ITEC, one game a week on free-to-air. Is that enough? Oh, I don't think so, no. I think you need to engage the general public who can just switch on Channel 10 uh, and watch a game, more than one. Um, we said in rugby league they've got the Thursday night game, the Friday night game, the Sunday afternoon game. The rest of the games are on Foxtel. And we're speaking, we were speaking off here about Foxtel as well. Um, and I was saying that I could go to any pub or club in New South Wales and they'd have uh, the A-League on, on their screens. At the moment, that doesn't exist. I don't know about you guys, but if you go into a pub and I was in one at Surrey Hills not long ago, and, um, you know, you want to watch an A-League game, they go, they don't have it. They've got Foxtel, not Optus. So what you're saying so, is it's possible to get uh, Foxtel uh, in a pub. Sorry, Optus for EPL. It's possible and, to yeah, get those. Paramount for the... For yeah, yeah. yeah, so what you're saying is it's very difficult to get Paramount in uh, institutions yeah, like uh, right. the pub at Surrey Hills that you were at. Yeah, so that's yeah. a problem. That is a massive problem because I, I, I like, you know... I. I I sit there because I'm passionate about the game. So I, I, when it was several games a weekend, I'd watch just about all the games. Yeah, all the I'd, same. I'd, I'd yeah. sit there and, and my, my wife thought I was an idiot, but that's all right. <laughs> but I sat there and watched yeah, all the games. Yeah. And she'd become a fan too because she was an AFL woman and she she come from Melbourne and she'd become a fan too by sitting there and being able to access that. So if you can walk into a pub and see games up there on the, on the screen, mm. then you get interested and you, and you and it you know, it tweaks your mind a bit. But, but if you don't have that access, then, then it's really difficult. Yeah. Bertie, really difficult. can I bring Bertie back in, if, if I may? Bertie, uh, uh, you're from an era where we watched you on SBS when we had uh, free-to-air television back in the 80s and 90s. Um, the game has certainly changed in terms of television coverage in 2022. Is it better or is it worse for you as a football tragic from a long time ago? I was very fortunate, and I've got to say that I had the experience to work in the TV area with uh, Harry Michaels and Dominic Gilardi, both for SBS and Optus. And uh, it, it enlightened me quite a lot to see what actually happened behind the scenes. Um, I, I, with the game, for me, it, yes, I always try and switch on. I've, I've actually streamed, I've bought the streaming, but that's the deal that's been done. I mean, if you look at relative aspects of it, I mean, we didn't have we didn't have a free to wear match when we had Foxtel. Mm, that's right. Yes. So you know we've got one up. So, but we still have all of our games televised. It's streaming, but it's televised, dissimilar to Foxtel. So really, the the equation hasn't changed that much. Um, we were they were uh, from looking at the. Um, 
the ratings right throughout the last three to five years, it, it hasn't been going up. It's actually been going down quite dramatically. Is there a reason for that? Well, I, I think the panel touched on it. Each one of them touched on a point very, very pertinently. Um, each one separately, though, which comes down to what we were talking about. Um, Benita mentioned about the passion and getting the, the people enticed to be involved very young, the culture of the game. All of those things don't just come up. They're things that take a long time. They're things that it started with children, as Benita said. It takes the culture that gets drawn right along. We had a severance of that culture at the highest level um, with the, the, the beginning of the A-League. It severed the grassroots. I call it the resolute supporter base. It severed that. And we've been in turmoil for a long time since. So there are a lot of factors, but I think the critical one is we need to get developing the culture. You start them at a young age, and this has been a very, very uh, important topic, and it was, again, part of the uh, streaming this week about the cost that it takes for a young uh, player to come through. A parent has to find 1000 1500 bucks a year to start them up, and they're doing that at a very young age. And, again, that comes from the... the the top-down funding, but ultimately it is a matter of establishing that culture because when you talk about who's going to switch on and switch off, what we have now is what you have developed as the cultural supporter, your 80,000 across the board. They're the ones that are going to be there all the time. That's your culture. Mm. That's not a great culture base. Mm. And that's what you need to be looking at. You need to be developing that. That takes 10 years minimum 10-year phases because you've got to start with the kids. You have to bring them up. They have to have that passion. They have to have that uh, unique um, desire and drive so that they will watch it and then they're going to be the regulars to turn on. Yeah, you get uh, a, a guest player comes on, it comes out a Del Piero or a Beckham or whoever it is, that's a whole different ball game. You get the people that switch a switch on and they're, yeah, we're here. But... It, to switch it on and watch is as simple as to switch it off and be away. What you need is that core, that basic uh, cultural supporter to be engaged, and we need to look at that as where we're going to get our base up. And that's not a, that's not a flick of a switch. Mm. Bertie Mariani, uh, great comments there. Yes, uh, Benita. I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting to... If you look at where the, when the A-League began, it began in season 2005-06... And so let's take a seven-year-old <clears throat> in 2005. Um, you know, they would now be in their early 20s. Are they still following the game? Um, and they're not. And this, is, you know, this again gets back to part of what the A-League has as a challenge. On the one hand, they've got rusted on supporters like us who, you know, you talk to some of the people in this room and they'll complain about, I never know when the game's on because I don't see anything about it, because the media landscape has totally changed. Um, and then you, got, you get people a bit like my own sons who played the game from that age, have grown up, gone to university, get married, that sort of stuff, and they've got other, um, other things to do in life and football, going to football is not one of them. And then you've got the kids who grew up with the A-League. They've only known the A-League. They don't have this baggage of anything else that happened. Where did they go? And to, ask your, to answer your question, what started the rot? I think 2015, when a article, an article was published in the Daily T Sunday Telegraph which named and shamed people uh, um, in relation to a Western S Sydney Wanderers match who, one, yeah. should never have been named by a person, but two, um, they were... Some of that information was totally incorrect. And three... It is without doubt that that information was fed to the paper by Football Australia at the time. And if you track um, crowds since you know, in the A-League, because you know, they did, we had some good years in the A-League, and then 2015 mm. when that rot started, um, that's when we also started to, the crowd started to fall away. Then we had the Congress Wars and people got sort of sick of reading about politics because, you know, really only 1% of 1% are interested in sports politics, you know, idiots like myself. Um, and so, you know, there's that combination of factors has led to people disengaging 
And so it would be wonderful to have a 22-year-old male or female in here who followed the game, who went to the first Sydney FC versus Melbourne victory game in October or August 2005 and asked them, where are they now? Are they still members of Sydney FC? Do they go to the game? And I suspect not. Mm. Yes, uh, yes, Bertie. Just on that, it's interesting you mentioned that it, you talked about your, your your children who watched the game. So I'm not and talk- played. And played for whom? Oh, well, we moved everywhere, Bertie. No, no, so. but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> this is where you, you talk about culture. You talked about the Evertonians. That's, a, that's what I'm talking about, that club culture, that tribal culture that yeah. you were talking about before. Yeah. That's where you need. You need that. And the A-League clubs didn't have it. They, at that time, were just simply franchise entities. But they've had 17 years. They've had 17 years to develop it. Sorry? They've had 17 years now to develop it. And so, but therefore, not players, the, seven, the seven-year-old in 2005, I would hope, I would hope is still a rusted, is now a rusted on supporter who goes to every home game of Sydney FC, for example. But I suspect they're not. There'll be some, but not, but not as many as there should be, because no, they no. still haven't built that culture. They haven't. And, and and if you... a, a really good example, I, I mentioned this again off air to Mike earlier. I'm a Sydney FC member, have been since day one. I learned when I got here tonight that they're having their awards night. Now, I didn't even know. Now, could be they sent an email and I didn't notice it, but the fact that I didn't notice it or disengage from it is also, I think, part of the problem that the A-League has is that they're not engaging at the level where people want to be engaged at because we're not all the same. We're not all looking at people watch, making little videos and putting them on Twitter. We're not all sort of sitting at the computer all day and looking at what's on Facebook. You know, we're all doing different things and that's why on the one hand they've got a lot of opportunities to communicate with people but on the other hand there are so many more avenues to fulfil. If I can come in here now and ask you the question, why is it that uh, these international clubs that uh, visit for games that really don't mean anything, they're just exhibition matches, attract 80,000 people, yet uh, these people that are going to the matches, they might be young kids in their early 20s who are normally spending time behind the computer, they're going out and watching the games with their parents or whoever, their family members, but why are they going to the A-Leagues? A-League, why is it they'll go see a Barcelona or a Liverpool but they won't go and see a Melbourne victory or a, or a Western United that just won the A-League? Anybody got an answer to that question? Because it's a Barcelona or a Liverpool. Because they're the best of the best. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Uh, we'll pass the microphone to you. And there's no connectivity between the A-League sides and the other sides, the um, grassroots sides in, in Australia at all. Mm. There's no connectivity between them at all. I mean, uh, you could do. There's, there's different things that they could do to to induce uh, crowds coming, but no one ever 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 poses those questions or or, or tries to introduce those things. So. Thanks for your comments. Let's quickly talk. About, oh, sorry, the, the, but the, and I get back to the tribalism again. And one of the things that was great of the early days of the Western Sydney Wanderers was our culture was Western Sydney. We we, we were sick of the inner city people who look down upon us. And that you might not like that, but it, that's how you form tribalism. That's how you get people who will support a club. And, 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 you, and, and you're right. We need to, to, to also, like, I'll just talk about the, the Indigenous part here. We need heroes. And so, so I used to get the Quarry Mail, which is the Aboriginal newspaper, and it was just rugby league and, and AFL, all of it. And then it, when I got with Benita, I decided we've got to get our football heroes there. So I started, I went to the editor and, I, and they gave me a column. So I was highlighting young Indigenous people who were coming up and, and you had Ty Minicon and all these type of players coming up who were in the, in the, the Qantas you know, youth championships and all that. And I put this up and, and people were talking to me and they said, oh, that's a, you know, we, we didn't know about these people. Uh, we didn't know anything about these people. So we had a, a shift. But Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't continue it, and but we so we've got to get get in people's face, and that didn't cost us anything. All it did was probably a, a couple of hours a week to write up a column. Oh, I don't think enough A League players in, in clubs send players out to meet uh, people at grassroots clubs. I mean, once again, I don't want to keep harping on what happened in, in yesteryear, but um, we used to go out 
I remember when I was at City United, I was at the end of my career, I was working for the club, and we set up a um, an, a three year agreement with Nepean Association. But in we were West, based in Southern Districts uh, in Western Sydney. So, yeah, so we had we had these two associations, and we'd send players out to Wentworth Falls and you know Blacksland and you know Blue Mountains and so on and so forth. They were nowhere near a Denzel mm. Park, but we did that anyway, and we'd send five players out for training sessions and and hand things out. I mean. That's what we used to do. Oh, they do less of that now. They're a bit more distant. It's all on online stuff. Um, I think that's it. But I remember going to a presentation day. I got invited to a barbecue at uh, Busby Soccer Club or something. And I remember I was playing NSL at the time. And the guy that invited me said, oh, let's have a little game. And I was playing with the little kids and I'm moving the ball around. And he came and two-footed me, right? <laughs> so well, he just gave me the big, you know. So, but I actually spent time going out there to a barbecue, you know, and I just don't think that happens now. Just... I, I think I'm not quite sure that that's right and, you know, happy to be corrected, but I'm pretty sure that it's in the collective bargaining agreement and the contracts that players have with A-League clubs now that they do have to do a certain number of hours. And, I, you know, I, I think it gets back to, again, what I said at the outset, the expectations. Um, and one thing we haven't touched on, and, and, and that's the media landscape, um, one of the things we lost when we lost the Foxtel uh, rights was some support from News Limited. Now, let's put aside what we might think of News Limited, um, and you might gather from my commentary that I don't think an awful lot, but at least we got some coverage in the major newspapers, such as the Herald Sun in Melbourne and the Advertiser in Adelaide, the Courier Mail in Brisbane and, and the Daily Telegraph here. We have poor old Don Bossy, uh, Vince Rigari in the Sydney Morning Herald, Michael Lynch in The Age, they're the only people now in the mainstream media. And this again gets back to the challenge that A-League clubs and NPL clubs and others have. We're having to get all the rest of the media by that 35% who are on Twitter or social media or do little videos and stick them places. Um, you can't get to everybody except through mass media. Can I, can I tell you, uh, Benita, that uh, the Socceroos are currently in Qatar trying to qualify for the World Cup later in the year, there's no one representative from any of the major newspapers on location there. Which there is are, unheard of. There are a couple of journalists from television, but that's about it. That's unheard of. Yep. So yeah. who do you blame? Do you blame the, uh, the editors of the various uh, publications or, or do you... We don't want to blame anybody, but that's got to change. Yeah. Well, I mean, change. I know from speaking to journalists who write for... For Fairfax, well, sorry, Nine Media, as they're called now, you know, they're, they're not, and, the, and the Telegraph said the same thing. Their number one performance measure is how many clicks are on their on on their article, and then how many subscriptions that drives. And if it doesn't drive enough, it's just like subscription TV. If it doesn't drive enough subscriptions, and if not enough eyeballs are looking at it then they're not interested. Yes. All right. And the big jump yeah. is that we've got to stop blaming things. Yes. OK? We've just got to stop all that because this is the wars that we get go we go back to continuously. We, we've got to look at the game as a whole, yeah. you know, and, mm. and, and ha how do we move forward? Well, that's that. the question in the short mm -hmm. time we've got left. We've got three minutes left. I'll ask you mm -hmm. to uh, <laughs> provide your summaries uh, in 60 seconds. If you had a crystal ball and you wanted to change the game, Benita, how would you do it? Moving I forward. thought that was going to be in the third hour and I didn't have to answer that question. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> um, I, I, look, I, I, think there, I don't think you can answer that question in 60 seconds. Um, you, I could say a whole lot of trite words. Um, Go ahead, and it hasn't stopped some, you before. And use some adjectives. <laughs> um, but I think fundamentally we have to look at where we want to be in the Australian market, um, realise as much as we might want to be the number one sport in the country, and we believe we are, um, realise that that's not going to work for a while and look at ways in which we can, if we, that's where we want to drive to in 50 years' time and most of us won't be here, um, that we work towards it. I take it a grassroots perspective. What are your comments? Uh, I know that the game is very expensive uh, in terms of introducing youngsters for the very first time compared to my day. Um, how do we change that and can it be affordable moving forward? Yeah, I think we need to connect the football community from grassroots right through and those pathways, um, once we do that, and that comes with good management at the top, I think the game can thrive. In terms of the cost of football, the cost at grassroots, or, you know, grassroots could mean many things, but um, if you're playing for your local club, I don't think it's, it's expensive. No. 
I mean, my daughter goes to dancing and I fork out 20 grand a year, right? So, um, you know, when you're talking about $300 for football, that's not expensive. Uh, the, the expensive part happens when you hit NPL level. Um, I, I don't even think SAP's that ex expensive. I think um, NPL is when you're talking about, you know, elite or representative footballers uh, to charge them just under $3,000 per year is too much. Um, but without it, you can't, a lot of clubs won't survive, So, which comes back to that uh, argument around uh, top-down funding models. But if we connect everybody from grassroots right through the pathways and we have good leadership at the top, I think uh, the game can go forward. And yeah. Warren, as an influential member of the Aboriginal community, what's your final say? I, I, but my final say is one of the passions I have about the game, and I keep on talking about this, was that... I used to wear rugby league boots when I first started playing, right? and the referee said to me once, he said, we can't let you play if you're going to wear rugby league boots. Those parents got together, and I rem I'll never forget that night, they, uh, Mr Lathan, who was our coach, he came and knocked at the door, my mum opened the door, and they put money together and brought me a pair of boots so I could play the game. And this is why I'm passionate about the game, They're just wonderful people. But what we've got to do is, is we've got to look after our supporters. We've got to make sure that, that our support... Because if you don't have supporters, you don't have the clicks, then you may as well just go play park football. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's the things we've got to talk about. We've got to talk about... The, because the fans in our game play a big part of the atmosphere of the game. I've been to in, in English games, I've been to Australian games and that here, and the fans make a massive contribution to that a atmosphere of that game. In fact, I, I know people used to come just to look at the fans. <laughs> and so it's... So, so how do we get that passion and how do we get that back? <laughs> well done. Well said. Thank you to all. That's part one of Everybody United for the beautiful game. Hope you've enjoyed the first part. And thanks also to Bertie Mariani for his contribution. Benita Mercyatis, thank you. Aitek Gensch, thank you so much. And, of course, you, Warren Mundine. Part one out of the way. Don't go away. Part two with George Tanikian. There's so much more to look forward to wherever you're watching, right across this beautiful planet. We welcome you. Stay with us. I'm Mike Tomalaris. We'll see you soon.
Welcome. Second hour of what promises to be uh, a very memorable evening. We are coming to you live from Sydney, and the best part about this is Tom, Mike Tomalaris has got the program underway, and uh, his array of guests gave us a chance to discuss uh, not only what's happening with the game in this country, but what we can do to boost the A-League for the next season and the seasons to come. Uh, the second hour, we have some special guests, and mine, of course, Archie Fraser, and uh, the great Ravi Rasich, and Warren Mundine, who happened to join us for the first hour, enjoyed himself so much, decided to stick around. <laughs> uh, great to have you here. Uh, that first hour was most entertaining, an opportunity to hear from uh, a group of people who have loved the game and lived the game and are still living the game, and they've given us a chance in front of this uh, audience to discuss some, sub some subject matter that really needs to be unpacked, further unpacked, because I believe there are so many topics that we need to address. But uh, if I may, we have a very important thing that we need to touch on at the very beginning of the program, and that is to Warren, to Raleigh and to Archie, I think we need a home for the game. I think we need a natural home. In fact, what you would say is uh, a bit like Cooperstown in America, the baseball, a hall of fame, a museum. Do you think with, we're draped with magnificent mem memorabilia? Do you think, Archie, do you think, um, Rally, do you think, Warren, there's a time to get a museum, a national one, that represents and covers the game? More than 100 years of history. Is this the time? I've, um, one, one thing I noticed about other sports is that there's this history and this celebration of the history of the sport. Uh, there are, you know, we've had incredible players over, over more than 100 years. You know, you've got Northern New South Wales clubs, you've got New South Wales clubs, you've got uh, Melbournes and, and Adelaide and those competitions. We, you know, I grew up with the, you know, with, that, with the old uh, Federation and New South Wales Federation Cup. And you had great clubs. Yes, they were ethnic-based clubs, but we knew the players. We could we could rattle their names off. We knew we knew about, and, and we need to celebrate our history, and yeah, we yeah. need to pass that history on to other people so that they have the passion about the game. The man alongside you has been push, pushing and boosting the game for the better part of the last almost fifty years. It's incredible. Years, actually. Well, a hundred years. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ravi Rasic, uh, is it almost time for us? to get that museum underway? I'm already there. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a football in front of you. That looks like 100 years old. This is about 100 <laughs> years old and comes from Scotland. You wouldn't believe. So, How Archie, me... you're, feeling, you're feeling the vibe? No, Archie, Archie had a, uh, a few points said about what about heading. He said to me, "Yeah, uh, this um, was given to me about... 50, nearly 40 years ago in Adelaide with, uh, on um, uh, Channel 9 with John and Mo and, um, and um, strictly said, come imported from Scotland. I would have expected you to look after that football. I did. <laughs> to, the, to the rest, that's, a, that's, that's something that I really uh, feel, you know, part of and privilege. And if you analyse... Um, me as a person, my inner feelings, then uh, what you see here for me is much greater than going to the World Cup. How so? Because I brought in the last uh, 50 years all these together. All these memories? All these memories together and this is only few dedicated to you to, to, to today to see uh, what is behind that emotion and feeling that we are talking about. Yes, well, Benita mentioned it, and we heard uh, Warren mention it as well, that uh, passion is part of the game. Archie, you've, you've seen the, how the, the passion can give us and give this sport an enormous uplift. Um, you've had an opportunity in your time at the, uh, the A-League and, of course, the NSL, and you've also, as a sports administrator, in your time with uh, uh, the AFL, you've seen how they do business. Are there things that we need to do a little bit better and a, a little bit smarter? Because someone said to me, we're not the fond of all knowledge. So are we smart enough to look at how the others are doing what they do and take some ideas? I know young mm. uh, Kevin Sheedy 
saw Indigenous footballers and thought all those years ago, hey, the A-League or the NSL is using them. And in fact, young Harry Williams mm. did OK for the Socceroos a long, long time ago. But that, that tap of, of first Indigenous or first Australian talent has been turned off, I think, in the A-League. The last one that I can remember was David Williams. Uh, Willow has been a magnificent uh, representative for the game. Mm. And he tells me before he, he uh, pulls up the boots, he wants to be a, a marvellous provider to get the next generation of young talent through, whether they're young boys or girls. Your thoughts? Well, I think it's a number of things. Uh, I think as a code, we've never really um, managed to secure the assets that we deserve, I think, as, as football. You don't really deserve, maybe it's not the right word, but that we, we probably should earn. Uh, I think the other codes have done a great job at securing funding, whether it's for stadia or grounds or homes or, or um, um, museums or mm. whatever it might mm. be. But I think they know how to behave, and I think they've got some really specific plans about how they, you know, what value they add to the community and how they do that. And the Indigenous piece is, is exactly that. It's, uh, it solves a problem for the AFL. Mm. Um, we really have never, you know, taken that as a plan and, and driven it through. So, and yet, I think the players are naturals, as, as we know. Uh, so there's some great Aboriginal Indigenous players. So I, I think, I think the, the planning in that is is the the outcome is really the planning that we've lacked over many many years. Mm. Um, do we deserve to have a home? Yeah, we do. But you've really got to to get large amounts of funds from the government. You have to add value to them and be a long-term partner. And, and I think we, we leave a lot on the table. And Have we provided you know, a narrative that will give us the opportunity to go to the government? And there's a new government in town, a new sheriff, so to speak. Is this the right time to maybe say to them, there's a marvellous opportunity to ground the game uh, with, a, with a museum and, and give it this chance? Well, I, I, think, this. I think it's bigger than you know, a museum. I, th I think it's, you know, if you look at, if we benchmark ourselves against the other codes that are in the, script, in, the, in the country, they've got enormous asset bases. You know, we, we, we've got larger asset bases in some of our state federations than we have for the game. Mm. And I think, I think that's, you know, something that we really should be addressing. And, and that's why we have a board and that's why they should have focus on that type of thing. Yeah, um, you've, you've, touched on, you've touched on some of those things that the, uh, the state federations have been involved in. We'll be talking to one of them, the, uh, the uh, CEO of Football Victoria, mm -hmm. Kim Ontelia, the rest a little bit later on. Yeah. But right now we need to cross to, to Melbourne via Zoom, an opportunity to catch up with a guy who's been part of the game um, I think he first came into the game in 97 in elite football and he was part of that generation that brought us Carlton in the old NSL. His name is Lou Sticker. He didn't just leave his credentials there, he got into player agency and he became a promoter and he's brought not only some of the biggest names uh, in, of the game down under, but he's also brought some of the biggest clubs in the world to Australia. Lou Sticker, welcome. Thank you, George. Uh, it, I, you? I, I, it's most menacing having you uh, right over my shoulder. <laughs> it's a magnificent studio. Uh, I've never seen you this large nor this sharp, but uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the discussion you, matter. So many things we need to unpack from that first hour. You would have got a chance to listen to uh, our special guests. What would you like to sort of piggyback on and, and take it to the next level? <clears throat> okay, this, that was very interesting. The um, first panel was... Uh, raised a number of points that really struck a chord with me. Um, and I suppose my take is, is that we as a sport find ways to undermine our own progress. Um, and I'm going to bring up some examples of that. Go on. Um, we, um, we started in 2005, and I'm talking about the A-League now. The NSL had a very glorious history um, for whatever the reasons that paused and resurfaced now as the A-League. Um, and, and we won't get into the arguments about old versus new, but, but some of the things that stick with me, having been part of the old journey and part of the new journey, is, is that we've had people running our game that actually don't have a feel for the game. And what I mean by that, I don't blame the individuals per se. I mean, if someone gives you a job and wants to pay you a heck of a lot of money to run a sport that you've got no background in, well, who's the fool, you or the person that gives you the job? So, so but, but the fact of the matter is, some of the people that have run the game 
since 2005, run the A-League, I should say, not the game, the A-League, um, have made decisions that hurt us today. And I'm going to bring them up. We're a, we're a small population spread across a massive land base, 25, 26 million people. It's a very, very finite supply of human beings. And uh, we actually did manage to tap in to the young audience. We had thousands of them behind the goals at Central Coast Mariners. We used to call them the Marinators. And then <laughs> the Wanderers, Melbourne Victory, massive support behind the goals. And our administrators have let security, a stadium security and police run these kids out of town. Now, do some of the people that got into trouble or caused the trouble deserve to be evicted from the stadiums? Probably yes. But en masse, we've turned away a generation of people. And that goes not just to the fans. It also goes to people that put their blood, sweat and tears into the game. People like Con Constantine up at Newcastle. I mean, we're a small population. We don't have many, many multi-millionaires that are prepared to put their dollars into football. And for whatever the reasons, if things go wrong, there should be a glorious exit for those people to sell their clubs, let the administrators come in, sell it off, and give some of the money back to people that have put in um, uh, the money yeah, to buy the licenses. Yeah. Yeah. So we just we have this tendency to burn a very, very finite population. Um, I've seen it this year. The three Melbourne clubs won the three trophies, and yet the stadium, um, if you only think back to three or four years ago, the victory, the, 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 the amount of crowds that that club has generated since the start of the A-League. They used to fill Eddie Hat Stadium, as it was known in those days. In year two, I think I went with my wife, 56,000 people. And remember, I'd uh, unfortunately been through the Carlton demise and I turned around to my wife and I said, can you believe this? <laughs> 56,000 people, mums and dads and kids that probably didn't know what a soccer ball looked like four or five years before. Yet, somehow, the game managed to attract a new, bigger, wider audience. And, and let me say, a lot of the people that were also disenfranchised from the NSL. So people of older generation embraced the A-League and came in their droves. And yet, bit by bit, because we've had people that don't have a feel for the game, we've allowed these people to turn our fans away. Now, the good thing is we've now got people at the FA in James Johnson and Peter Philopoulos, football people who actually have an understanding of what it's about. And then we look across at the APL and we have Danny Townsend. So finally, after 17 years of the A-League, we have people in key positions that actually know what sport we're playing, what shape the ball is. And it's no disrespect to those that were given those jobs. I don't blame them. I repeat, if someone comes along and says to me, Lou, would you like a million dollars to be the CEO of uh, table tennis? I don't know how to play table tennis. I'll take the million dollars. I mean, it's it's just uh, the way it is. So I, I think that that is a major problem. And one of the resultant issues is that there seems to be every time someone comes into the game as a CEO or as a head of honcho, um, five-year plans. We turf out the previous five years and we come up with a whole new five-year plan. We don't have continuity. I actually think this country is very, very unique. Uh, I, I can't talk that much about other cities, but let me tell you a little bit about Melbourne. Melbourne is the events capital of the world. People go to events. You've just, okay? dis you've just disenfranchised the whole of Sydney. <laughs> you've, you've just... <laughs> We've got the MotoGP. We've got the horse racing carnival that lasts for the better part of a month. We've got so many other sports. So what's happened is people tend to go to events. Now, I'm going to read you something that I picked off the social media about five minutes ago before coming on. Go on. And I'm going to read this out. Why are fans not turning up? Why is the food pricing at stadiums ridiculous? Why can average families not uh, afford it? Uh, why are there minimal parking options? 
why are there rule changes ruining the game? Why are there, why are there Thursday games and Sunday at 3.20? This is all garbage. Now, by the way, that's not our game. That is what people are saying about the AFL. There you go. So we're not the only sport that has issues. Every sport has issues because it's the country that we live in. Mm -hmm. See, I was one of the guys that was very keen on the game going back to winter. And people would say, oh, no, you can't do that, Lou, because you're going to be competing with the AFL. Well, you're competing with the AFL 365 days of the year. But you wouldn't have the grounds. You wouldn't have have access to the grounds. Oh, yes, you would. Amy Park would still be available. But the point is, without getting too bogged down, is, is that in Melbourne, for instance, we don't get as good a weather as some of the northern states or, or like Perth. So so I go down to the beach in um, late January. So I'm down at one of the beaches down at the bay and I look around and there's Matthew Leckie from Melbourne City there and there's dozens and dozens of young people that I know who they are and where they come from and soccer is their number one sport, but they're not going to get dressed at four o'clock, put a suit on and sweat to go and watch A-League kicking off at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the middle of summer. So scheduling scheduling is a problem, right? Correct. Now, I think the people that we've now got running the game will address these issues slowly. We've got to give them time. Uh, You can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater every time we hit a roadblock. The last point I'll I'll make, and then I'll shut up, (laughs) is we talk about the game in this country and... Um, it is what it is, and it's not the number one game. Well, there are countries in Europe that have two sports. Take Italy, my, the, the country of my, my parents. It's either soccer or Formula One, and they've missed two World Cups. So they should all be jumping off the cliff. <laughs> but you have a bad, you have a bad run, you come back. I think what we've achieved is, is we've had a accumulation of success at the national team level, and the A-League has had some big ups and we've got some lows. We've got to just let it level out. We can't pick on everything that goes wrong. There you go. You can't pick on everything that goes wrong. So, Raleigh, join join, uh, Lou. What do you agree with? What do you agree with all of it? Lou is much more administrator than I am. (laughs) (laughs) Right? I've been opposition in many ways. Right, but Lou is a very truthful, this is opinion based, give people time and uh, they should uh, um, produce results, right? Um, So um, with Lou, with all his experience and what he puts into the game. Well, he's a promoter too. uh, So so when he says to you... Enormous amount of time and effort and... That has to be respected. What, I, I suppose. Rally, what do you make of the situation with the policing at the football? Some would say they're heavy-handed. They're not giving the the youngsters a chance to enjoy themselves. Uh, the active support group, uh, as Lou touched on, has walked away or has threatened to walk away time and time again. Uh, and I know from being a Melbourne City fan, uh, there are many times when I didn't want to go to to uh, was it Eddie Had because I knew just the torrent of, of noise that would come my way. And, but I can also remember a time when I took Ferran Soriano, who was our special guest from uh, Manchester City, to that game when victory beat Melbourne City convincingly. And he just sat there, refused to answer his phone, it was, which kept ringing for, our, for the entire hour and a half of the game. And he was watching the crowd. Yeah. So he was taken in. We're talking about a guy who runs the City Football Group, Manchester United, or Manchester City, rather. And, Lou, you're spot on. He, he was gripped by, by that experience. Yeah. I can tell you from my experience on Wanderers uh, that, you know, the RBB, which attracted people to that game. Correct. People went there and they just loved the RBB. Loved it, yeah. And we were <clears throat> continually fighting with FFA about that because we, we, this is the thing that I talked about is earlier. State, we don't we is, don't respect our supporters. Okay, here's the question I have for you. Is it the state government? Lou, you, you'd be across this. Is it the state government who owns the grounds that sets the parameters and, and instructs the police to behave? No, I, or, I can answer that for you, George, because you? I was head of the A-League and my first week in the, in the game I was called to a banning meeting, which astounded me, uh, given I'd been CEO at St Kilda and obviously a football lover and football player. 
Um, and we were actively meeting with um, a covert group that we had employed at the FFA to actually check out the fans and, and, and sur do surveillance on the fans. Yep. And I was just amazed that we were driving that, that behaviour because ultimately that put an enormous cost onto the clubs because we were effectively tell briefing with the police or potential issues. Now, the realities are these, these groups or this company we'd employed were actually um, surveying the blog sites you know, and I remember Adelaide was playing Melbourne Victory and three young kids had said, oh, we're going to come and, you know, knock over some chairs in your pub or whatever. Well, you know, that doubled the policing and it doubled the footprint for the traffic management and it doubled the cost of the stadium. And we were actually driving that behaviour. And I was astounded with that. I remember, you know, saying, well, you, you, you can't be serious. And yeah. then we had des designated seating. So we yeah. actually created that ourselves within the FFA um, executive committee. And, and we drove that for years. And that's what caused the mo most of the issues and the cost that that put onto the game and the joy it took away from games. I mean, fans were getting ejected in Brisbane for taking their shirt off in 40 degrees heat because the Suncorp security staff had been briefed to say, don't let them, take, don't let them stand up and put the, take their shirts off. Uh, clearly, they haven't seen the Wellington Phoenix fans <laughs> in New Zealand. Yeah, well. who take, it's, it's minus five and yeah. they're waving. Yeah, but they're still they're blue. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lou, white. Lou uh, you've had uh, an opportunity to bring many a club, a big club from around the world, down under. Uh, what, what have you had to say to the, those uh, uh, policing units and, and those state governments, when you're bringing some of these teams down under, is that a big question? Security? It's a, it's a difficult one to answer, um, George, because a lot of the times um, you've got various parties involved. When So when you bring an international game, you've got state government who puts money in, so they bring um, their pressures to bear. Um, I think, look, I, I think the, 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 the international games is another example of what I said earlier on about events, that we have a tendency to come out for events. I was at the Barcelona game a couple of weeks ago and we caught the train in um, and um, there were people that were standing around wrapped in Barcelona gear that I would say to you, I, I would put $100 on it that they would probably have not been to an A-League game over the journey. But many of their friends, because their background and their socioeconomic group and the geography where they come from, I would say a lot of their friends would have gone to the uh, Wanderers games for that same reason that Warren said, the atmosphere, and yet they saw people being driven away. It's not that they've abandoned us, George. We've, tu we've turned them away. We've turned you know, them that, away. That's the key thing here. And the game never stuck up for the fans. So the game did not stick up for our fans. Let me let me just ask the audience: uh, Would you agree with Lou? The, the 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 game hasn't stuck up for the fans. Bertie, agree. yes, consensus yeah. across the board. Across the board. So the game has got to stand up for the fans. Uh, and I think what Lou said is is correct. I mean, the people around the game now, at least our football people, they understand the importance of fan engagement. They understand that. So. I would like to think that Danny and, and James, you know, and, and specifically Danny, probably more in the A-League, will, will do that and stand up. And given the owners own the league, clearly they don't want to spend additional dollars that are purely wasted. No, no. Security is still important and we want to have a safe venue. There's no question about that. But I think there's a, a limit in how high you need to actually go to and it needs to be sensible. I've been told time and time again, uh, if you want to run something properly, governance is key. Uh, now, what I'm hearing is we've got to be smarter We've got to have people who know the game and understand how a game comes together. And Lou's touched on it, Archie's touched on it. Um, Raleigh, you've seen the opportunity time and time again. You've immersed yourself in, in many a great game and you've been in the middle of some of those special moments. Do you agree with the boys? I agree. Uh, I agree. That, that goes for quite a while. Uh, but without excitement, there is no game. Mm. And um, if anything, Wanderers and that Parramatta area before the game was good enough to get into the pub and I'm not a drinker and I would go home back was good enough for me to see excitement of the young people. But if one of them threw the bottle, it's called riot. Yeah. Right, right. which is fairly unfair. Uh, uh, but I'm here for different reasons. Go on. Uh, these are experts in different fields, and I'm expert in mine. I'm here 
to tell you something. You see this picture there? Yep. See? Yeah. Looks like it's a story that you've written, is it? No, I didn't write. The writer is in the corner here. Yes. And this article, I was paid $4,000 those days. That's a well, lot of money. At where, Essen, where, when met, did they pay you? I, I met, met the writer at Essendon Airport. Yes, but that what, was, year, what just, year are we just, talking? Just, just, just a second. <laughs> uh, I was not paid a Socorro coach for $1,000 that time. Right. I was paid $10,000 for four years. Wow. And I invested into all of these that you see here for the benefit of this great sporting nation. And I oppose anybody in this country who can challenge me on this history because I'm a member of Sports Australia Hall of Fame and when I walk into MCG Stadium and I see small square box uh, with a Mariner's training shirt, where is our history? Where is our pride? Where is the honor of our country? And let me tell you, these heroes of 74 qualified on these principles, everything for a national anthem, everything for a national uh, pride, six different nationality, six different languages, and, and picture here. Yes. Uh, who's who's hitting and who's, myself? Who's hitting and yourself, yes? Private jet with John Travolta, one million salary for three months. Yeah. 10,000 for four years. Ouch. No. I will do it again. <laughs> I so, do it tomorrow. So what you're telling me is the passion I, is the I'm key. I'm telling you it's passion and uh, we have to create and give something to young generations of Australians that we are equal or better. Yeah. We are definitely better. When Del Piero took the field, all stadiums shook and stood on their feet, right? Yeah. Means they understand what quality is. And only two weeks ago, Dwight York, new coach, new yeah. manager, yeah. he took team with a lot of pride and honor and met Barcelona in every aspect of the game. And 80,000 people. Yeah, so about 71,000. All right, 71. Yeah. They, I don't want to scare the AFL because they, right, get, they get every any fine. anytime you mention okay, a number okay. they get very they call get it, offended. Call it seventy one thousand people. But who left the stadium unhappy? No, no, no. Not a yeah. single person. Uh, because our team matched Barcelona in every aspect of the game, including uh, opportunities. Yes. Uh, scoring opportunities, yes. including technical aspects of the game. Yeah, right. I, th I, th I thought Correct. we contained, yeah, yeah. And gamesmanship and sportsmanship, which they said Aussies played a tough and rough game. No, no, no. It I, was not the case. I thought, I thought but, we saw some but, great youngsters too, but didn't I, we? I, Rale? I, I some just, youngsters yes, too. But I just say, said to you, we, I, during my lifetime, I will be 87 in in a month's time. 87 young. And I want this before, long before I go down, but I never go down, right? <laughs> You're before making it I to 100. Down, We've decided. I want, I, want, I want this country to get this special <laughs> gift and to, to, to match or, because rugby league can't match this. No, no. Okay. Aussie rules can't match this. Well, I was just going to say, yeah. the AFL uh, was, you know, was blowing its trumpet the other day yeah. that they've managed to attract the biggest number of crowds over the last uh, half a dozen weeks. And, and no one mentioned the, the 71,000 who turned up in Sydney to watch an exhibition game between Barca and the select uh, A-League uh, uh, team. What did you make of that, uh, Lou? The AFL, again, very quick on the narrative, very quick to pump up their uh, their sale. I admire them, though. They George. do it better they're than anyone. They're protecting their patch. Well, not only they're that. They're protecting their patch. And Every... the problem is, yep. we look for excuses. We, yeah. Our fans complain that we don't get articles in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Well, do you realise that now, unless an article has a minimum of a 1,000 uh, digital reads, in other words, Impressions, subscribers yeah. Yeah. read that article, people 
uh, the, the editors are basically pushing our game further and further into the obscure part of the paper. And that's because our fans, all of us, don't spend money. We don't subscribe. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't bash the AFL. I admire what they're doing. They, they've turned their sport. You could put a monkey in the chair as CEO of the AFL and in 12 months' time come back and the business would still be in very good nick because <laughs> what, they, what they've got, George, they've got a solid structure. Yeah. We, we have, all we have is we have a lot of flaws. But now that we've got some good people in the chair, in the positions of power, we've got to give them time. They can't fix everything overnight. Um, before uh, I, I move off, yep. I want to say, Rale, um, Jack Riley rang from Scotland about an hour ago and he sends his best wishes to you and to everyone involved in this uh, show, George, and obviously very, very special thanks to Harry Michaels. So that's coming from Jack Riley, your goalkeeper in 1974. Uh, Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Thank the, you. Thank not, you. Only, not only did Jack uh, ring to say all the best, but he also wanted us to make sure that we, we, we establish that the next five years are really important for the game. And as yeah. Lou touched on, mm. next year... Yeah, the new, or the new season, an opportunity for the new APL, the newly independent APL, to stand up and make an impression. Yeah, and also for Football Australia to adjust its sales because it's sailing into a World Cup year for our Matildas. So, Warren, you've got uh, Kaya Simon, yeah. uh, you've got Lydia and, and a host of others. And is there a crop of youngsters in that next tier that excite you, first Australian women, who, who really can take us maybe into that final? Yeah. Could you Just imagine? before I get on to that, I'm amazed you got paid $4,000. I only get paid $800 of my articles, <laughs> but anyway. We don't mention money in front of Lou because <laughs> he's, he's seen some good ones, but he's also had some moments where he's had to wear it. So yeah. he understands how yes, important yeah. it is to make a good business decision yeah, yeah. and then deliver. Yeah. Well, look, one of the great things that has happened over the last few years yep. is, is the growth of the women's game. The Matildas would be right up there as one of our top sporting loved. clubs, yeah. Look, yeah sporting everyone just yeah, loves yeah. them. You, know, you, you see them turn out mm. and you see the girls turn out and everyone turns out to see them play. And, and I just love watching them and Sam Kerr and Kyra and all the team and Lydia Williams. and that. They're a great team and, and a great product. And, and it's about ACA. How can we work off that for us? And, right. and, and I think that's it. That's again. It, it, that's about passion. You can see the passion of those young girls mm. and those young people who turn up and watch that games. They pack them in. They do. They do. Because that's it, been a long time coming. We've it been has been that a long time. For a while. It, it, and this is why what Lou says is true. We've got a new team in. We need to now who's got passionate, who actually loves the game. I just and that and I agree with everyone that. Not having people, and don't knock them, you know, they no, no, someone paid me a just, million dollars for table with me. tennis, I'll take it too. Warren, but, let me just bear one moment. Uh, we've got to give uh, Lou a chance to get yeah. going. Lou, Lou Sticker, thank you very much for, for being a guest and giving us a chance to, to canvas some of the subject matter that was discussed in the opening hour of this special, Everybody Unite for the Beautiful Game. Uh, we wish you continued success. Uh, he's been a big part of the, uh, the Brains Trust at the Tribal Sport... Uh, management group, and uh, I want to know what the next big surprise is. Lou, are you going to give us anything before you go? Well, when I find out, George, I'll let you know. All right. I'm usually pretty <laughs> close to the action. So. All right. But uh, no, we've just got to keep plugging along and uh, enjoying the good moments and pushing on. All right, and be yeah. balanced. Thank yeah. you, Lou. Lou Sticker, Thanks, joining Thank us. Thank you. All right, Thank gentlemen. You. Another Thank guest you. coming to us via <laughs> Zoom. It'll be the CEO of Football Victoria. In just a moment, I think it's uh, a former NSL striker. You might have you might have seen him play a few games, Kimon Taylorus. Do you remember Kimon in his playing day? Uh, Are you Ray? questioning my memory? <laughs> never. I would never question your memory. Yeah. Never question that. Uh, what did you make of him as a striker? He strike quite well. He strike quite well. Would yeah. he, would no, he be no. in your team? Uh, no, but he was um, in. Is that a no or a yes? Uh, in a generation of different players, you can't compare that. If I said that um, that um, something could replace Oti Aboni because 
You see this picture here? Yeah. Paul Breitner, Roti Aboni. That's a moment in time. World Cup, right? Yeah. Then Alston, first Australian player who was offered contract with Eintracht Frankfurt yeah. and uh, Hertha Berlin. Then he finished in uh, Luton Town because of his English background, yeah, which he's... was a silly decision, and he knows it. <laughs> then he went to American Pro League with Cruyff, Beckenbauer, Pelé, named them all, not he played against all of them. Uh, so Kimon, of course, uh, aggressive, fast, uh, polite. Had a nose for goals. Uh, yes, yes, and uh, uh, a different generation and, and different type of football under different coaches. Uh, but uh, I dare not say that any striker was better than Nodi Olsen. <laughs> it would be. And Ray Bartz, may God help you. Uh, in my books, still the greatest player Australia ever produced. Can we just pause for a moment and talk about Ray Bartz? Because what people don't readily appreciate is he was given a, an opportunity to join Manchester United at a time... No, he was at Manchester United. Well, yes, but to, uh, to sign a long-term contract, and he chose not to. Is that correct? No. No? I got he, it wrong? His, uh, his father got seriously ill. Uh -huh. And uh, he was ahead, uh, you wouldn't believe, he was ahead of Brian Kidd at one stage at Manchester mm. United. And Brian Kidd, shortly after, played for England. Yeah. And uh, that tells you how the, great Ray Bartz was. The, the quality of the yeah, man. Amazing. Amazing personality. Great Australian. And that really what makes this, when you say Socorro, uh, dressing room is different when you walk into that room and you say Socorro. <laughs> right? uh, well, here's a Socorro. Um, yeah. uh, he's joining us from Melbourne. Uh, I think he's ready via Zoom. Let's see. Kimon, there he goes. Uh, uh, Kimon Taliadoros, welcome to the program. More importantly, the coach, the boss, uh, Rally Rasic, the, the man who led our Socceroos in 74 to, to West Germany in those days, um, has just been pumping you up, saying that you had a nose for goals and like, he, liked, he liked the cut of your jib. <laughs> well, well, that's a, that's a fine compliment. Uh, thank you, Rally. Um, you must be getting soft in your old age. Right? <laughs> I, really appreciate, I really appreciate the kind words. Thank uh, you. Now, you join us at an interesting time. Uh, we've had, uh, mm. we're well into the second hour of the, our program tonight to, to talk about everybody united behind uh, the beautiful game and getting more of what we can out of the A-League. And, of course, there's Archie's right in the middle of discussions talking with uh, this next tier of clubs, the uh, the AF, the A, double AFC, is that correct? Uh -huh. Who were contemplating putting some, uh, some teams together and pitching for a national second division. Mm. Uh, you're right there. You're in those discussions. Uh, what is your mm. feeling? And what can we do to tie this game ever closer and to give the A-League a boost for what promises to be an exciting new year now that it's independent? Well, I, <clears throat> I think uh, we, we're in a fabulous position. Um, we've been through a lot of turmoil over the last few years, fundamental turmoil to the constitution, the nature of our Congress, the relationship between the professional game, the amateur game, uh, a whole uh, uh, batch of uh, fundamental issues, and they're playing out as we as we as we have been going in the last few years. Um, the complication with COVID, I think, has exacerbated. Uh, perhaps, yeah, and, 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 and really, I suppose, in many ways, enabled us to to really focus on on the key move, the key, the, the roadmap ahead. And, and at the heart of that is everyone understanding who should do what. Now, in in the seat there, you can see Rally, who understood that better than anyone. Not only is the narrative important for a team the motivation, the sense of common sense of purpose, but each person in the team uh, needs to understand their role. They need to understand their individual role and they need to understand their role within uh, the team and uh, in pursuing the team objective. 
And so, you know, you would you would recall there's, there was a change in, 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 in the chair, the leadership of the game. Uh, there was the divestment of the A-League. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, there was uh, the, the welcome introduction of, of fine football minds. Who are who are really taking responsibility for for the future of the game and um, and, and you know change comes slowly it really does and uh, because we have the overlay of the complexity of the federated structure that's a that's a unfortunately a, an anachronism a, a legacy that we've inherited that we're all seeking to solve because we want to do things better we need to do things better which means uh, understanding the various roles and having clear um, demarcation makes it a lot easier for us to to generate the returns out of our limited resources. Can you see a, a way clear? Can we, can we see a roadway and a pathway for all of us to, as you say, play our roles and make sure that we move the game ever closer? And there's something else that we needed to do, and that was to bring the, the divide from old and new. And from all those clubs that Archie and, and Warren and Raleigh remember, were the great old clubs of the NSL, We've got to give them also an opportunity to dream. There's nothing more exciting than dreaming. This man here, the boss, uh, managed to bring a bunch of part-timers to do something to finish in the, the final 16 of the world back in 74. That's unheard of. If I said to you, I'm going to grab a bunch of part-timers, we're going to train like hell, and you know what? We're going, we're going to make it to the World Cup. What would you say to me? What are you drinking? <laughs> and how much of it yeah. have you been drinking? But he did it. That's right. And those, well, those magical stories are some of the best things about sport, aren't they? The, 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 the success of the, the underdog and the exceptional circumstances, the resilience, the incredible achievements of, uh, of unexpected achievements. But if we're to take a mature approach about our own future, we can't rely on moments of magic. We need to have structure and a sustainable, a sustainable plan so that we can expect to be competitive consistently, um, not only in grassroots in providing value for money and, an, and, a, and a magical and a, and a wonderful experience, but, but looking and to go deep into all the tournaments, all the tournaments if we aspire to be, uh, to be uh, you know, a football country. Um, Kim, on just hold on that, that thought for a moment. I want to go to Archie for a, for a, for a second. Because Kimon tells us that there's an opportunity to go forward if we are smart. Uh, you mentioned to me uh, before the program there's a, a great way for us to look at marquees. They're not just a sugar hit. They don't have to be just a sugar hit. There, is, there can be a smart way to do it. Do you want to elaborate? Yeah, yeah well, I, I, think, and I think the marquees next year will be an important part of the A-League for sure. But uh, I do think there's a, a synergy with, um, with trade and, and with the government to allow us to utilise the marquees and potentially not the burden falling on the clubs. So I, I think there's some work around the model there that potentially the corporates who want to you know, really partner with the government to do trade deals, and Cameron and I have talked about this a couple of times, um, I think there's a gap there for that, for us to do that properly and, and therefore build some real credibility and real partnerships with the government into trade areas that large organisations in the country want to get into. And, and ultimately, at the moment, the marquee cost, if you like, falls on the clubs, and that's been difficult, and it means that some clubs will choose a marquee player that none of us are going to, we don't know their names, and we're unlikely we're going to go and watch them. And, and again, in the time I had at the A-League, we, we were trying to work with the clubs on the level of marquee player, and we're saying, if, if it's not going to put 5,000 on an away gate, yep. or 8,000 on your home gate, well, why are we doing this? Why are we paying somebody 750 when we can pay them 1.5? But the burden still falls currently on the clubs, and I think I think with some thinking around there, with the right people in the, in the chair and the modelling, that we could we could um, partner with the government, partner with trade trade, you know, um, of the country, and put it into countries and locations where we not only sell our wares, but we can build a football relationship with them as well. So, I, so I think, football politics. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes partly because of some of the people we've had running the game, yep. they don't really understand how big the game is in those parts of the world. And, and now I think we have got people who understand that. And I do think if they actually, you know, I, I've said a few times, we squeeze a lemon and we throw it away, you know, yeah. in football. And, I, and I, I love people, you know, it's a throwaway line is normally there's no money in football. I think there's a huge amount of money in football for the right offer. 
yeah. and for the right outcomes. So I, I noticed sort of Kimon shaking yeah. his head agreeing with you. Well, I mean, that's only an idea, but I'm saying that's the sort of thinking we need to have about the game because that, is, that, that gives us a competitive edge. Yeah. The AFL can't touch us, the NRL can't touch us, cricket can't touch us. Nobody can touch us if we actually play that and have a five-year, 10-year, 15-year strategic plan on delivering that. Question, and it saves money question for the, for the, uh, the panel. Uh, the social media coming in saying, um, is there money for the AAFC? Is there enough revenue there to run a second division? Well, well football's, you know, uh, there's no... Um, you either make a club work and it, and it closes up if it's, it's like normal business. So I, yep. I don't see... You know, I mean, I think people will get behind football. Um, I, I think the realities of promotion to the A-League are a long way off. Yeah. I, I mean, the realities are, and it would be good if we were just truly honest with each other on this. I think that's another thing that would be handy in football. Well, if the A-League is closed shop till 2034, then tell everybody else. Yeah. So all the clubs playing in the second division don't get excited about promotion relegation because it's never going to happen. It may happen, yep. but at the moment they don't have to make it happen in the A-League. And there's nothing wrong with that, so long as we know what the rules are. But at least in the second division, I think, I think the sort of clubs that have put their mind to it and the effort they've put into it over the last five years, we started this five years ago, this debate in, the, you know, in, a, in a meeting in Melbourne, um, which I think 120 clubs came together in a very short notice to talk about the fact is they wanted to play at the highest level. Yep. And that was it, was it was clubs, it was administrators, it was passionate football people. It was a great room to be in. Um, and they were all about saying playing at the highest level. So as so long as in football you're allowed to play at the highest level, if you run out of money, you're going to get relegated and you're going to go and play somewhere else. But your, your club won't fold, in my view. So I, I, think, I think football is, you know... That, so our thinking has got to change, hasn't it? Eh? Well, I, I think so. I mean, there's no divine right to stay open just because... There's, there's you know, a young guy, he looks vaguely familiar to me. In fact, if I look a little bit clearer with that lighting, it's Peter Catholis. How are you, George? How are you, boys? I'm, I'm fine. Here. Have you got a question Keep for on, us? How are you, mate? Have you got a question for yeah, anyone special? Hey, Hey, by the way, are you hitting that two iron as long as you hit it ten years ago? We're not talking golf, <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> Man, just a question. Um, with the federations, uh, you know, there's a lot of politics. Uh, different federations are doing different things. Uh, do you agree that we've all got to basically be on the same page to go forward for Australian soccer to, to go forward? Because that seems to be a real stumbling block... Uh, Everyone's got their own agenda, way of doing things. What, what, what's your take on that? Kim on? Yes. Thank you, Peter. The answer is yes, Ken. The answer is yes, of course it is. Of course we have to be on the same page. And <clears throat> the appetite exists for that and it's existed for that for the last few years. Uh, but for COVID, I think we'd be significantly better off. That's why I'm particularly optimistic. I, I realise that there are indicators at the moment that are not favourable. They're not necessarily trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I'm confident though some the fundamentals that underpin uh, many parts of the game are making progress. I genuinely believe that. And uh, as a result of that, I do believe that uh, we, we will see an uptick. The member federations, the states, we, we've inherited a, um, you know, a, a, a historical legacy and, and Warren would understand this as much as anything, anyone being involved in, in politics and the challenges of federal and <laughs> And state responsibilities in you know health and education. We have to we have to untangle these, mm. untangle them, and a clarity of thought and purpose. I think is the only way we can do that. And, and yet we still need to operate within a federated uh, country. And so uh, finding that finding that balance is is Key. our task. Um, there's no doubt, and I can assure everyone on this on this broadcast that there's, there's a unity of purpose in achieving that and that's why I can comfortably sit here and be ambitious and enthusiastic about what lies ahead. Kim on, Talia Doris. Um, Warren, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm only, I'm only 26 and as you can <laughs> see, uh, the politics of Federation has really worn me down because uh, I spend 99% of my time arguing with state and territory governments about trying to get things done. Uh, you're right. It, it is something we've inherited uh, today. It's, it, it, uh, it was good. The past was good, and we had great clubs and great players who come out of that past. But we, we need to move forward now, and we need. To, and how do we move forward? And about how do we rearrange that structures and that? And and it is about 
you know, what's because the problem of, of federations is, is you know, self interest, and the self interest always is. Uh, Paul Keating to, said, You want yeah, to back something? Right. Self interest. Yeah, you've got to bet on a horse. Says, yeah. Call it fills for interest and put your money on it. But Warren, fine. as we've heard from, from Lou Sticker at the very beginning, and Kimon has touched mm. on it, and Archie as well, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you think long and hard, We've, we've got to be smarter than ever before. The opportunities yes. lie ahead. We're running out of time. Another hour is, is coming up, and we've got um, a young fellow by the name of um, Andrew Pascalides. He's using the same uh, shampoo that you're using these days. <laughs> so I'm actually dyeing my hair, but anyway, that's Don't go a there. blonde. Do not go there. Uh, Kim on, um, before I go any further, before we let you go, I want to touch on something that Lou touched on, and that is the police. Uh, there are so many people saying to us, it, the, it's over-policed. Uh, we don't need four million policemen to turn up for a game that has, uh, you know, 24,000 people. And, and more importantly, um, they've got to change their view. Are we still talking to them, Archie? Are we still talking to the police and to the state governments who are the holders of the grounds? Can, do we have better relationships there? I think our relationships are strong. Uh, I do feel, though, that it's incumbent on us to take the time to try and uh, educate... Uh, what, the, the terraces? ...or the various... Well, the terraces as well are expected. I mean, antisocial behaviour is not acceptable. No, no, it's I... It's not I, acceptable. I... It's, it's just not acceptable. So I, I, I'll never defend that. But what I will... What I will say is that um, football football fandom um, seems to be quite unique, and certainly in Australia, it, it, as, as Warren said, you know, it is. And therefore, um, the, the the police need to perhaps understand that better. And whose responsibility is it? It's not theirs; it's ours. You know. And so, you know, I think I do feel that that's part of our part of our, our challenge. And, and certainly, when it comes to um, you know community football. Uh, with uh, uh, the behaviour of spectators, mm -hmm. coaches and club officials needs to be acceptable. As yeah. There are children playing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and so that's really what, for us to be hoping that they come back next weekend to play again, we, we need them to have a positive experience and, and certainly experiencing antisocial behaviour racism, um, homophobia, or whatever form it might take. We've got to um, get on top of is it. Is challenging? Well, it's challenging our society, isn't it? And from a football perspective, our responsibility is certainly uh, ensuring that we do that at a game day. Uh, so um, I'm going to let you go, uh, Kimon, before that we lose that Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> Kimon Taliadoras, the uh, man who is the CEO of Football Victoria, joining us, and he's been a great contributor. Uh, you might like to put your hands together and acknowledge the contribution. Well done. Archie, thank you very much. These days, partner at uh, Brown & Chase. Your still talent acquisition is in your heart. And you're also uh, in search. You're doing a whole lot of search, aren't you? A little bit of search. Well, all the very best. Um, the man who's no need to search, he, he knows where he's going all the time, <laughs> he's getting this memorabilia I mountain <laughs> sorted in a house that really do, uh, you know, does reflect the history of Australia. And Australian football is more than 100 years old. Um, Warren Mundine, thank you very much for sticking around a second hour. Uh, you did the extra time, but let me tell you, with that, uh, that look and that polish, you did it seamlessly. Uh, well, there's going to be a lot of women watching this show, so oh, yes. <laughs> My wife said to me, uh, make sure you tell Warren's wife that everything will be OK. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Warren Mundine. Thank you, thank you Rayleigh Rasic. And Archie Fraser, thank you. Thank you Another George. hour of the game coming up. Great discussion. Everybody unite for the beautiful game. Andy Pascalides with his special guest coming up next.
Good evening and welcome to the third hour of this unique broadcast facilitated by Harry Michaels OAM. I'm Andy Pascalides. I'm a football tragic. I've been involved in the game for now 50 years. I started playing when I was nine and it's just breathtaking to be back to where it all began for me. My first appearance on Australian television was right in this studio with Les Murray, God rest his soul, uh, with a wonderful show that uh, Harry produced here called Soccerama. It's been an absorbing two hours. If you've just tuned in and missed the first two hours, don't panic. You can watch it back on YouTube again. It's going to be there forever. So let's go straight into this last hour. It's a unique mix. And I'll start with the lady that's getting her first opportunity to talk about football because she represents the future of the game. And I'm talking about Angelica Georgopoulos, who has many hats as uh, Strathall Strikers Junior Vice President. I mean, Football Australia, Football New South Wales Game Development Officer, Football Community Champion for the Women's World Cup bid, and, and, and. God bless you, Angelica. Great to have you here. The one and only Peter Catholis, a man who has played at both, uh, uh, you know, NSL level and Australian level, of course, with the Socceroos, has won three titles playing for the likes of Arpia Leichhardt and Marconi Fairfield, of which... One of his coaches is in the studio, the one and only Rally Rasic, and also had a stint in Greece, the cat, Peter Catholis. Good to see you here. Well, I don't want to say that you've played in too many countries and for too many clubs, David Carney, but you have. <laughs> you have. How many countries have we talked about? Seven, I mean, from Uzbekistan to England, but you're a man of experience. You've played in the Premier League, of course, uh, Blackpool in England, and you've represented your country with esteem. Two wonderful stints in between all that, with Sydney FC, and you even played at Everton with a guy called Wayne Rooney. <laughs> David Carney, we welcome you. And last but certainly not least, before we go to our special guest in Doha, this man is now the CEO of the Wollongong Wolves. Now, for trivia buffs out there, Harry Michaels was once the owner of the Wollongong Wolves, and he brought out Alan Brazil, Paul Mariner, Trevor Francis, just to name a few. I think we touched on it earlier. Sorry, Dolovsky. Referee of the decade, as judged by the players, a FIFA-accredited referee, A-League referee over, what, 145 games? Am I on the money? Yep, Oh, I'm on the money. And the first man in the world, the first man in the world to use the VAR. Australia was the first country to use it, and you were in the bunker. Correct. Not a fan of the VAR, but but that's another story. (laughs) The good news for Australian football fans in midweek, twofold. The Matildas are going to play at the new stadium, which is just around the corner from my place. It looks fantastic. They'll be playing Canada uh, later this year. But the Socceroos got through that first crucial hurdle, and now they face Peru for that spot at the World Cup, where we've been playing ever since 2006 after a 32-year wait. And all of us, well, I'll kiss the cross before I go to Doha. James Johnson is the CEO of Football Australia. He came in in December 2019. It was a tough initiation when you think about it, going through a a pandemic and trying to restructure the game and get us back on the right right track. And we'll cross now to to James, who's in Doha. James, how are you going, mate? Hi, Andy. I'm doing well, thank you. Great to see you. I'm just just a quick one. Is Lou Sticker your agent? (laughs) <laughs> I wish Lou Sticker was my agent. What a, what, a, what a man he is. He gave you a huge rap. And, and it's probably one thing in the game that I don't mind asking you this. He said having football people in the key positions of the game is crucial for our future movement. Look, I, I think that's right, Andy. Um, I think if you're going to run a business, you've got to understand the intricacies of the business. And we're in the football business so naturally, I think football people need to be uh, at the table and making decisions so we get the right outcomes for football. So I would agree with that. Now, what about uh, the Socceroos? Uh, one game down, one game to go. I had a look at the Peru friendly against New Zealand. Uh, they look like a formidable opponent, but we always know that. We've been down that path playing off against South American opposition. But a one-off in a neutral venue is always an interesting mix. It is, Andy. And look, it's been a very long uh, and complicated qualification process. We had a a year where the team were effectively uh, not playing, like all national teams. Uh, And when the teams were playing, Australia was in a more complex situation than than most of our competitors, simply because we couldn't play home matches at home. Um, But the reality is the the, the team are one game away from qualification, 90 minutes of football away from one... uh, for qualifying for another World Cup. 
Um, and I can say being on the ground here that the team's in really good spirits. Uh, there's a lot of energy and I think this team believes that they can uh, they, they can win and they can win against Peru. It's going to be a tough match. They're a great team, uh, fifth place team in South America, which is probably the most mm. competitive confederation of football. So um, I'm totally excited. I hope the game is because it's going to be a cracker of a match on Tuesday morning, Australia time. Now, qualifying for the World Cup, it's not just the benefit of the millions that we get through FIFA, but the flow and effect to the game, the sponsors and everything else that comes through it, the media coverage, because we're seeing a lack of media for our game at the moment for, for differing reasons, but it's so vital, isn't it, for the soccerers to qualify? It really is. I mean, if you look at the strength of the brands within our football brands, uh, our Socceroos are historically um, our strongest brand, and they still are. As, as a sport, um, we have seen a major increase with the Matildas brand over the past couple of years in, in particular. But to have the Socceroos brand uh, first uh, in, in front of everyone's minds around the country, mainstream media around the country, this is really important for the sport. So absolutely, if we qualify, this is going to be great for the sport because we're going to see a lot of interest leading into Doha in November this year. And the obvious, having it on free to wear, it looks like it could be SBS's last coverage of a World Cup, which is sad in so many ways when some of us have worked in previous years with, with SBS. But, you know, looking forward, uh, aside from the Socceroos, what the Matildas have been achieving for a number of years is fantastic. There's been controversy along the way, coaching changes and whatnot. Uh, they've restructured, rebooted, and there's so much to play for coming into 2023 in the World Cup. I think there is Andy, and I think that's a remarkable story for the uh, for, for the sport. The Matildas brand, whether you measure it on social engagement, broadcast numbers, match day attendance, uh, revenue streams, uh, the, the the players that are playing at top clubs around the world, everything is on a steep increase. We've seen that over the past two years, and the pace isn't getting slower. It's actually getting quicker and steeper as we head into the Women's World Cup. So the brand now is is very strong. And I think that's fantastic for the sport because the true strength of the sport, in my view, is two strong national team brands, both mm. on the men and the women's side, um, very connected to the community. Uh, and we know that community is also our strength. So we've got two million participants uh, playing week in, week out and engaging week in, week out around the country. To so to have a, a men's team going to Qatar, a Women's World Cup in Australia next year with a thriving participation base, I think is fantastic for the sport and the Matildas are a key part uh, of that strategy. Sarah Walsh has said, and, and quite rightly so, she wants a 50-50 uh, balance male-female in terms of playing the game. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, do you think it's feasible? Do you think that can happen? It can happen if we get legacy, right, Andy? And if we look at the major competitions that have been played uh, around the World, World Cups I'm talking about, 1994, the Men's World Cup in the United States, for example, it, it saw the birth of Major League Soccer, which today is one of the best competitions in the world. Our focus um, has been for the past 18 months on ensuring that we take advantage of the Women's World Cup. What we don't want is to end up um, in August 2023, where we've had a fantastic competition, best women's competition in the world, but it's just a memory. That can't be the yeah. outcome of the Women's World Cup. It needs to have created legacy. And part of that legacy uh, program is around ensuring that we can meet uh, higher targets for participation. The reality is that our biggest growth corridor in our participants is girls and women. We're about 23% of the overall pie, but this is the quickest developing part of the sport. And we think that the Women's World Cup next year um, will increase that growth, but it means that we also need help from the governments to ensure that We've got the right facilities to enable that growth because the growth will happen. Um, do we get to 50-50? I think we're going to go close. That's the goal to get there by 2027. And that's going to mean concretely 400,000 more participants for our sport. And we're already the biggest participant sport in the country. So massive opportunity, Andy. And hopefully we get government funding to, to flow in and uh, better facilities, as you know. Uh, even finding with my charity work, uh, heart health testing, I couldn't do tests in Newcastle. No synthetic pictures there except Lake Macquarie. Nothing in the Illawarra, but even in my little association, nine synthetic pictures at Football St George. So with increased numbers comes increasing demand for facilities and naturally governments and local and state have to get engaged. And uh, 
it's something that's always been a bit of a bugbear for our game, just a, a lack of regular facilities. And with the weather and coming out of COVID, as you know, it's tough, tough on all grassroots footballs. I think that's right, Andy. But if we look at some of the signs over the past 12 months in particular with Legacy, we're seeing more government investment yeah. come into the sport than we've actually ever seen. We've got $100 million that's going to the home of Matildas in, in Melbourne. Um, we're looking at major stadium upgrades in Perth uh, and also in Adelaide. Um, we're, we're talking to the New South Wales government about a home of football. Um, and, I, and I think that that trend is going to continue to grow into the Women's World Cup and beyond mm. it. And that's what legacy has got to be about. Yeah, one of, the, um, one of the panel discussions earlier, you probably didn't hear, was talking about a home, a museum. It's long been discussed. I know that there's been a lot of discussions with individuals and in Football Australia. That's one thing that I, I admire, the, the, the leagues and the unions and the AFL. They really acknowledge their history and, and it's important to educate the next generation as well. Yeah, our, our history is, is important, and, and why wouldn't it be? Because our history is, is a magnificent history. It's a beautiful history of Australian football. Um, we don't have a home yet of Australian football. We have offices, yeah. but it's not really a home. And I think as we develop or continue to develop and shape our identity, that home of football is going to really become key. Uh, and again, if we're ever going to get a home of football, um, it's going to come on the back of uh, a major tournament that we're hosting, like the Women's World Cup. What's been the toughest uh, mission for you in the journey so far, given you, you've still got your L plates on effectively and you've come in at the worst time during a pandemic? Well, week number uh, five or six, COVID hit, Andy. So I think uh, uh, that was a, a challenge that I think any leader or any, any person in society has really not had to experience. So that, that, that's been challenging and it was challenging particularly in year one, which was the year 2020. Um, but I think as a sport, um, we're pretty geared towards these sorts of challenges. We're very resilient as a sport. Um, we've tried to put in a vision and we've really tried to focus on trying to unite football and bring the community together around issues. And I think COVID, one thing it did do is it really brought the community together. And I must uh, congratulate, I think, the community at all levels because we got through it. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're better for it. And uh, if we can get through COVID, I think we can do a lot of great things in the future. A fantasy story, wasn't it, for John Aloisi and Western United? And, and hats off to them. Um, it's one thing also with the A-League, obviously not under your structural control so much now. It's a separate entity. Great TV ratings and all that for Socceroos and Matildas, but it's just, the, you know, the A-League ratings are not where they should be and, and if you're you know, in business to make money, you want to see the ratings increase and, and we, we get that. And knowing the TV, TV demographic and how that works, how can, how can you see that increasing? How, how do we generate bums on seats at games but also lift up the TV ratings? I think just, just to be a bit nuanced with the TV ratings, so if we look at, and I come back to the league, but if we look at the, the Socceroos, they're, they're about where they have been. So there's been no decline, but there also hasn't been an increase. The Matildas, the increase has been very, very steep over the past uh, 18 months, particularly since we've moved to, to 10. Um, there has been a decline. That's a fact with the league. So we, we're, we're aware of that. Um, I, I, I'm not too concerned about it at this stage, Andy, and I mean that sincerely. Sure. We've gone through a major restructure in the sport um, and we're a year into that process. And, and I've seen these before in, in different parts of the world. I've been involved in these before. And usually for a season or two or possibly even three, after you unbundle a league from a federation, um, you, you, you do see some uh, measurements that you're perhaps not happy with. And I think that's where we are with the league. Having said that, though, in the medium to the long term, um, the league will bounce back. You've got a, a, a good uh, group of executives on the ground that Danny Townsend's leading. Um, you've got good ownership uh, within clubs. You've got a, a, an entity like Silver Lake coming in right now. Mm. There's money there. Um, I'm not worried about it whatsoever, but I do think it will take some time for us to start seeing those measurements increase again. James, just to end on a lighter note, I've got to ask you a couple of quick questions. Where did you first start playing football? <laughs> in a, a small country town uh, in central Queensland uh, called Rockhampton, I played for the Bursica Bears. Uh, they're, they're a local team. In fact, uh, I was in Rockhampton only two weeks ago for the first time in about 25 years 
and I was given a Bershka Bears shirt, which I'm, <laughs> I'm very proud of, and it now sits in my office. Uh, so that's where I grew up playing. I moved to Brisbane when I was about 14, 15, uh, to pursue my career, actually, um, where I played for a team called Mount Gravatt and then the QAS and Brisbane Strikers. Um, but I did finish my career relatively early. It's about the age of 22 or 23 years. Wow. Now, who was your favourite soccerer growing up? <laughs> uh, look, there, there, there's a lot of them. I, I always admired uh, Frank Farina yeah. as, a, as a person. Because he's um, a Queenslander? He grew up. Well, that's that. That is one reason. But, but he, yeah, he grew up where I grew up. Um, he would come into uh, camps when 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 we were coming through um, our era. He'd, he'd talk to us. He was a very humble person, and he was always always uh, open to talking to young players. And yeah. as a 12, 13, 14 year old, um, he was a star at that time. And the fact that he gave players like me, who were, you know, just trying to improve the time of day, is something I'll always remember. And uh, you know, I think he's uh, he's the quality of that person is, is just outstanding, and he was a great player as well. I won't, I won't disagree with that, mate. Looking forward to seeing you when you come back home. Hopefully you can make it to the NSL reunion on July 16th for my charity, and thanks for supporting my charity on that note as well, mate. We're, we're continuing to save lives, and that's another part of football that's important, the health and well-being of our players as well. God bless you, and good luck against Peru, bud. Thank you, thanks James. so much, Big Andy, round of applause and for James evening. Johnson. Thank you, the CEO. For Football Australia, I'll start with the new generation. Am I safe to call you the new generation, Angelica? Absolutely. I give what, people life crisis at that point, though. <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts on today's discussion overall, though, about the game? Where do you see the game at the moment? And you're in the front line. Well, it's, it's interesting, right, because I was at the 2005 match uh, with John Aloisi and scoring that goal. I was falling asleep, though, on the seat, so I do have to admit that, though. So that iconic moment I did miss. But I was there. Uh, but I think from my perspective, I, I've seen the game at its worst um, from a women's perspective, I will say that. Uh, and, and where it is today from a women's perspective, it's unbelievable. And I'm so proud of how far we've come and that the benchmark now is being set higher and it deserves to be higher. And, and with the boys, I've always grown up watching them. I always have this soft spot for them. I, I always want them to do well. I think the problem that we're facing, though, is, is a massive structural issue. And I see that at grassroots level. And I see that the world of football is, is split into two different pathways. You've got grassroots and you've got elite football. And unfortunately, those paths don't correlate. And there's a massive junction that, that these two don't meet. And in my dream would be to see that mm. those two pathways do correlate and do connect because at the end of the day, grassroots deserves to have that spotlight that it's not getting that this elite football and and as much as we need it we need to go back to the grassroots yeah. and say hey this is where it all begins but we're missing that step yeah. and and personally from my perspective that's where we got to fix in this game crucially well the gentleman next to you has always talked about the technical ability of players and the pathway of players and if you haven't got the money you're in big trouble you can't play in that elite level and the gentleman next to you Peter Gonzalez <laughs> described by Ferenc Bushkis as the most technical player he's seen in Australia you can, you can hear the story and you've seen the story, Peter. It's, a, it's an, an area of the game we, we need to address. Look, like I said, uh, I asked him on before. I mean, look, the politics of the sport have got to go. We've got to unite. And, and there, there it is there. Everyone does their own thing. As soon as everyone starts thinking to, you know, the goal is to make the game better and we unite, you know, yeah. we'll, the success will come. There's the real problem. You know, I'll give you an example with the with the technical side of things. You know, technical directors. You've got technical directors in different states, and um, you know, when Australia had their own technical director, well, he's supposed to be guiding everyone and follow that particular you know plan or curriculum or whatever. Well, everyone does their own thing. And then, then you wonder, <coughs> they don't want to listen to each other. Mm. And then you wonder why everyone's pulling in different directions. So that, that, for me, that's the key. The key is to have uh, people united, federations, uh, grassroots with uh, senior football. I think, I think grassroots is so vital. I mean, grassroots is the base of the pyramid. Without grassroots, our game's in a massive, massive hole. And I mean, this is where we all start as footballers. 
administrators, coaches. We start at grassroots. Talking of coaching, congratulations, Dave. Uh, you're taking over at Wollongong Wolves next season and you've got your CEO next year. How about... The, the topic's just covered now, but what you've seen since you've walked in the room, it's, <coughs> it's, it's a very important discussion that the game needs. How do you see our game at the moment? Uh, well, yes, obviously grassroots is very important, but the things I keep hear, hearing regarding parents from a young age now is the money, paying yeah. money for yeah. the kids to stay in the game. And I'm not being funny, but sometimes the best players aren't from a, the, the healthiest of backgrounds. So... Yeah. I think, um, I don't know what we can do about that, but regarding good players and give them an, sort of an education to to get to a path, like I think losing the AIS was a big mistake. Massive. You know, player. massive, massive mistake because I remember when it was a path for me to go to Everton, if I didn't go to Everton, I was going to go to AIS. You were 16? 16, 16 when you... but if I didn't go if I didn't make Everton and you go to AIS, where I was going to go, you know, so... And a lot of the good players back in the generation, even before I was there, a lot of good players came from the AIS. But talking about grassroots, you need to get in the grassroots to become good enough to get the AIS. But if mm. money is an issue... You're in trouble. We, we, you're we, in trouble. We, God knows how many players we've lost. That's right. Because the other <coughs> sports make it affordable for kids to play. Your AFLs, your rugby leagues. Exactly. And that's always been the hardest part of the equation. When you're a young family, you've got two or three kids and they're all good players. You might be able to afford for them to get the, uh, the, the proper coaching that they need. Shrebe, how's um, administration going as against blowing a whistle? Yeah, it's um, actually, you know, last couple of years I've been with uh, Football Australia as Director of Referees. So um, <clears throat> when I retired in 2016 and basically became the face of the VAR, um, then I moved into administration after that and um, was head of referees as basically last couple of years and then um, moving into the CEO at the Wolves I guess um, you know there was, it was a pretty pretty simple transition for me um, whether you're dealing with coaches on a weekly basis mm. or CEOs um, you know you're dealing now with state local governments and and, and, and grassroots to, to you know everything that's been discussed totally agree it's, that, it's, um, it's, it's amazing nursery Wollongong you, you're looking at the gentleman next to you you're Luke Wilkes you're Scott Chipperfields you're Checkerleys and Petrovsky I mean there's so many players it sort of does frustrate me that you do not have representation on a national level God willing it comes because Wollongong is sort of lost in the in the cycle at the top end of the game and it has been for a number of years absolutely and you know <clears throat> I started on the 1st of May, uh, 1st of March, and one of the first things I had to do was appoint a new coach uh, for next season. But um, I, I, think it's, I think it's fantastic that, you know, these types of things are, are happening. There's discussion. It's really, really important because I agree, we need football people in the game that understand um, at all levels of the game. And I also agree that grassroots is, is where it starts from. So if you get the foundation strong, um, everything, <coughs> everything moves forward from there. Angelica, what's the message you're getting at Grassroots Football week in, week out? Because you're, you're not only playing, you're coaching, you're mentoring. How are you seeing the framework now? Because we're coming out of COVID, so the season's in full swing outside of washouts. But thankfully, at your ground, you've got two synthetic pitches. Well, the, the big one that I hear on the sidelines, it's, it's an expensive sport. And, and not from just a single player perspective. I'm talking, if you're looking at a, a football family... You know, you've got two kids, say, dad plays, mum's now playing. That's, that's over $1,000 right there. And, and I've got families turning away from the game because of that. And I know we've talked about it before saying, you know, if you're looking at a single child, no, football is not expensive. But from a grassroots community level, football is very expensive mm. for a football family. So I think that's the biggest issue that I'm facing right now is how to keep kids in the game that can't afford it, families in the game that can't afford it. How do you see the top end of the game? Top end of the game, I think... I don't think I'm allowed to say it on TV, but I think... Say it! Say it! <laughs> uncensored, I think we've got. I think we've got a, a, a lot of uh, princess behaviour. I think there's a bit of... And, and I use that word because that's what's coming across. It's this level of, of uh, entitlement and I deserve to be here because I've paid my way to get here. And unfortunately... That's showing on the field, and I know that's a bit controversial, mm. but from my perspective, it looks like we've just bred a bunch of kids that 
have paid their way through the game? I'm not going to answer that. I'll leave it to the panel. You guys can... But Kat's, Kat's shaking his head. He doesn't want to be thrown under the bus. Look, I know. Look, I'm going to get into another... another you know, this you is know. a good point, Kat. This oh, is... Look, Dave, you got anything to say? I've just it? started Maybe. coaching, I, I, so that's the last question I know. Sure, you know, well, I, 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 totally, I, I totally agree. Um, almost back 30 years ago, it was the grassroots, there was the intermediate, which was basically like the real... Um, academy or representative team, and then you went on to the to, to the uh, old NSL or whatever. So, <clears throat> I think the, the 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 pool is now diluted with academies, and there's you know 20 academies over here, and you've you've come from the Socceroos or you've got a name, and you create an academy. And NPL uh, players, you know, we talk about um, junior kids are paying upwards of two and a half thousand dollars per child per season. So we speak about two. To, to two kids in, in that system that have talent, that's over $5,000, $6,000 What about, this, what about this one? You make state team these days. Before it was an honour, you know, you make the state team, they take you away, trips mm. or whatever. Now they want to charge you. They that's want to charge the parents to, for the gear and to, to go away. What, what sort of a crap is that? I mean, yeah. And that, and that was I truly mean, that, that representative. Be, that yeah, was truly you, representative. You make the state team, it's an honour. You know, yeah. I remember the day, and that, that's what it was. Well, you, you remember when, when you play for your club, if you're good enough in your association, you, you represented your association, you weren't allowed to leave your association. So the pool of players that played rep football came from there, unlike parents moving their kids from club to club to club. And the best part of it was you represented your association and you didn't pay. Not you were best. treated like the best of the best, There's a lot and you of, felt honoured. problems right. which they need to sit down and sort out. The thing is they've got to basically talk to each other, um, you know, get, keep the egos out, off the table, and um, that's what they've got to do. Uh, at the end of the day, marketing the game, look, marquees. The marquees that we've got, you know, they're not the top... Not, they don't look, attract It's, it's hard, Pete. Look, I'm telling no, you, no. it's hard. And I'm telling you, coming from wearing my commentary hat in India, where I've been for seven years... Right, they they started that league. The Del Pieros and all these players were going up there. Right, Kale played there. His last season of football was there. Dave Williams has just had a standout season. He's moved to Mumbai with City Football Group. We are getting outbid by other markets. That's the cold hard reality. In Asia, it's not as great to come here and play because for other clubs, for other players overseas, they're getting more money in China, Japan, other countries. I'll tell you the point I'm trying to make, Andy. The thing is... We need Mark we have, We've got some really good players that are playing the game. You know, yeah. everyone's having a go about, you know, the quality, blah, blah. You know, we realise the quality could be better. But, you know, we still have a, a good product. The, the problem is, you know, the TV numbers have gone down. Well, guess what? The Paramount application... How many people can get the Paramount application? To watch the games. You, you know, I'll tell you, <laughs> this, I, my handle on that as a viewer, right, and as someone who's worked for pay TV and free to wear, you know, SBS, how good was it? Rush Home Saturday, World Soccer with Les, Music Highlights of the Player Having the Birthday, Sunday Morning Serie A with Martin Tyler, On the Ball with Johnny and Andy, Match of the Day Sunday night, Olympic Airlines Highlights Monday night, all for free, one place stop. Now, I'm going to get Stan for Champions That's League. I'm going to get Optus for Premier League. I'm going to get B in Sports to watch uh, La Liga. Oh, jeez. We've, We've got boxes everywhere. We've got boxes everywhere. Where do I stop? Jumping on How do you feel Andy. about it at home? It's just incredible. I just want to be able to pay one service provider and I want to see whatever football I can get from around the world. Mm. Andy, just to jump on that, uh, some of the kids I coach, I've got girls who've never watched a football match in their life. And, and that shows... Never the watched? Yeah, yeah, never watched a football match in their life. And, and that comes from the culture of not being able to watch football. And, and I think part of the, the crisis that I'm facing, even, even in the women's game and, and the men's game, is that we've got kids that aren't watching the game. And you can't learn if you don't watch. And I think... That's a very that's... good point. You can't learn if you don't watch. You can mm. be coached. Yeah. But repetitive viewing, repetitive watching, players want to emulate the heroes they see mm. on TV. I can tell the kids that watch football every day. I can tell. You can see the vibe that they have on the field. They're hungry for it. The kids that don't know what a striker is are running around on the pitch. And I can tell because... We, we haven't established mm. a culture of, of sitting down as a family watching the football. The ethnics do. In, in, my, in my background in Greece, I know we all watch it on, at the Barea. We sit there and we, at the 
the clubs and the even the mm. coffee shops. There's no culture of that here. We don't have coffee shops watching football. We Café Mio. Café, Café Mio. You know, we don't have we don't have that. And I think that I is thought a it was in a space for a while. There. Sorry. <laughs> I think I think it is a little bit of a, a cultural issue in terms of uh, embracing that mm. uh, that ethnic that ethnicity that is what football is. I mean, you go around the world and and football is the culture. It's mm. not about creating a home of football. It's making Australia the home of football. It's not one singular place. It has to be everywhere, in my opinion. I agree. I think I think what Benita said earlier too about. We've got to accept we're number two sport. We're the biggest participant in sport, but we sometimes hide behind that shadow and you know, beat the drum and, you know, we are the biggest sport. Well, we're not. We're not in terms of what we should be doing as a game moving forward. And talking of moving forward, one, one part of the game that it's hard because we were so touched by it and it goes back to what Dave said about AIS the golden generation. We're all waiting for that next golden generation, Dave. And it was hard for, for players like yourself because you were coming through at the national team level as the golden generation was pretty much, in 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 a, in a way, tapering out. Mm. Do you ever think we'll get there again? I mean, that we had how many players playing in the Premier, say in Europe, in that soccer team? Pretty much the starting eleven were playing for top leagues in Europe. Everyone. Yeah, pretty much everyone. It's hard to say. It's really hard to say, really. Um, I think watching the Socceroos lately in the last, say, four, eight years, it's it's the turnover of players, players. that we're not getting a consistent team <laughs> every time we watch them. And that's hard to watch where back then... You knew who was in the who was starting. He's starting, Kiel He's starting, Duke starting. Even yeah. if it was 11, 16, yeah. you sort of knew. At the moment, we're watching them the last six, four, eight years... Pretty much the last four years, even this uh, World Cup qualifier campaign we've had, it's a different team every mm. time we watch. Not just different, sometimes it's different eight mm. or different 11, you know. it's We don't know who we're going to watch. Injuries don't help, don't get me wrong, and players not playing at the top level anymore. Mm. That's, that's really, it's really hard to watch because of that. But then, so it's very hard to see who's going to come through when there's a constant change all the time. Just getting a question on social media. Which way should we go for marquee players or a specialised TV show? So it's an open question. I can see why you'd say TV show because I think that one way you can generate te television interest, look at your core market. Your core market are kids. So there's nothing there for kids. I believe football is broadcast to a male-centric audience now, you've lost an audience already, which is your grassroots base. Create a show around them, a specialised TV show. Then, market the heroes. So those kids want to emulate the heroes that are playing in the A-League. And all of a sudden, there's that connection. But anyway, I've, I've answered a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I think, I think for me, Andy, the, 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 um, and you know, looking at it from a Wollong point of view and, and just our area, but the, the, the focus has completely changed um, in Australia regarding football, for me. Um, previously, the focus was on development, and we, we develop, develop players through, through grassroots, through to <coughs> elite, AIS, and there was programs for that. Now the focus is all about money, right? Each uh, member association, each association, they're only worried about their own bit of turf. They're only worried about how many academies we can create. It dilutes the players, right? And because we dilute the players... We have a situation now where we, the, the, the cream don't rise to the top. So these kids that can pay their way through, and, and that's, that, that, that is easily the way to say, oh, you're, you're made it because your, your parents can, can afford it or your, your dad's in the club and sponsoring mm. and you're paying. And, you know, that's the, that's the focus. And um, with that, those players dilute and, and the best won't come to the top. So for yeah. me, um, previously, <clears throat> the focus was on development. We had the AOS, and that was pure in regards to each association. And if we talk about Wollongong, um, now in Wollongong we have many, many different academies and mm. pre-SAP and there's this and there's that, where before it was grassroots and the best of the best come through to this, um, it was called Illawarra then. And you played for Illawarra, mm. that was basically the Wolves youth team, and then you played for the Wolves. So that was the pathway. Now th there's too many academies, too many delusions, and, and people, you know, Ex-players, nothing got to do with ex-players, but anyone that with a profile has an academy, 
and parents get fooled by that, right? Mm. Saying, oh, I'm guaranteed to go to play for the Socceroos. Or, no, no, or, or, or we have a you're going to get a go. European club. There's going to be scouts. Or, or, or a this. connection, right? So what happens is um, they don't go through the proper pathway, as I see it. And this mm. is a problem at, for me. And <clears throat> we talk about communication and, and, and people talking to each other and egos aside. Absolutely. The only way we're going to move forward is these organisations come together. And I'm, I'm talking Wollongong here, where we have... Uh, three organisations driving in three lanes with uh, the Wolves what, and football. What, sorry, South what's Coast. the biggest sport in the Illawarra? Football. What's number two? Uh, Basketball is pretty popular. I know that, but and cricket, the season basketball and cricket. So rugby league union. Those other sports that are strong in certain areas, certain markets. Rugby league strong, but but the football. Participation so you, you've got a bit. you've got a bit of a jewel there, and you're trying to work out how to polish that jewel and and sell it at top value. Now, I'll tell you one thing about that um, AIS. And I, I used to love going down there and film the boys there in camp. And they, you turn around, they're all future Socceroos, pretty much. You know. When you played, Pete, and it was before your time, David, one of the good things I saw in terms of development of player, of young talent, was the National League would be played at 3 o'clock. At 1.15, the National Youth League would be played. So these kids, 16, 17-year-olds, are playing before Peter Catholis and Kalansis and Patikas and Raskopoulos and, and so on. And then sometimes a few of them are sitting on the bench and then getting game time. I uh, thought that was very good uh, for the that development was, of that young That was boys. crucial. But let, let me tell you another thing. I never went to the AAS. You okay? didn't need to. N not, n nor did a lot of other players. The other thing is we played with our mates down the park. Yeah. How many kids do you see go with their mates and play down the park these days? It doesn't exist. So, you know, when you interact five aside, six aside, and you're playing in the streets or playing in the parks, this is how you produce footballers. The other thing is, exciting footballers put bums on seats. Are they either, either they're marquees or they're exciting young players that you bring through the ranks? Mm. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. These players are the ones that have pulled the crowds all over the world. Players, clubs... Go and get marquee players, get top of the range players, yeah. players that can make a difference, players, players that are creative, players that are exciting. We had some great ones in that's, the daily. Let, let's be honest, I was having a discussion a couple of nights ago. And you look at your Fauna Rollies, your Broishers, and so on, you, you would have played against a few. Del Piero was obviously a standout. Dwight, your first season. Oh my God, how much publicity did the game get? Now, you go looking. Look at the newspapers, and you're flicking in. You, oh, there's four paragraphs that, down there. And back to the quality of the marquee. So, the marquee. What's the criteria when you bring out a marquee? You know, have the have the marquees been attractive for people to? Got to do it on mm. and off the pitch. Basically. Correct. Has the marketing been right? Mm. See, these are all the questions and that are, need to be answered. People need to, mm. you know. Get, get it right. Let's, let's, okay. What are the positives in the game from your perspective? I'll, I'll move along to you, Dave. What's positive right now about our game? In the A League or? Just our country? game. Our game. What do you think? Probably people that want to play it. That's the thing. Mm. We've got a lot of people that want to play football, but like you said before, they're not getting the right path. They're not getting, it's too expensive. People want to mm. play. I don't know, I come from, done certain things similar to this thing. I don't know if it's true or not, but AFL players are pinching, up, pinching soccer players, footballers, because they've got a good physique and everything's paid for. So they're saying to the parents, yes. come, let's come to AFL, everything's paid for, you've got this, you've got that. That should not be happening. What can we hijack from the other sports then if they're doing that to us? Well, it's money, isn't it? It's money. It's got to be government money. money. <clears throat> Someone's going to pitch the government for mm. more money. That's the, that's the key. AFL, rugby league... Even netball gets more money than soccer. That's right. Well, you're uh, talking about getting more money. I know that there's a. You're trying to get more funding for, for a, a, a facility down in in the Illawarra, aren't you? Yeah. I, I so you're trying to deal with government now to. Uh, forgive me. Is it lighting that you were looking for, or something for a facility in in Illawarra? Yeah. So our, our home ground. You know, this, this is one of the things. It's not only just, I guess, unique in Wollongong or anything, but it's probably across the across the country in regards to. And it was discussed before around government funding for for basic facilities. You know, um, whether it's lights and you know, in in Illawarra, we only have one synthetic pitch. In just the, one. In just one in the Ordal of Illawarra. So, with the current 
<coughs> with the current weather there has been over the last six months, uh, people haven't been able to train. I mean, as, as a club, as Wollongong Wolves, we were training on um, futsal pitches, outside futsal pitches, where... Was that at the fr Sydney, fraternity club? At the fraternity club. Not um, that I know. <laughs> and we had, we had um, you know, under eights all the way through to our first grade teams training there, trying to fight for, uh, you know, small-sided futsal pitches to train on so we can train mm. uh, because everything else was um, unsafe. And, and teams, obviously, we talk about Sydney, where every kilometre there's a synthetic pitch. This is, this is a serious issue, uh, for, for, for sport, right? Um, if we're talking about largest participation, well, give us the facilities to be able to do it because mm. I think it's a key thing. But put my refereeing hat back on um, and, and something that is completely missed here. We're talking about the, the, the huge, uh, well, the introduction, you know, the rise of women's football and the rise of all this participation. Well, no one talks about the referees, mm. right? True. You True. can't play a game without a referee. And if you think about it and you talk about parents and, you know, complaints and um, issues with parents on the football fields and junior sport and parents, I, majority of the time it all comes back down to a refereeing decision, right? So one parent says something because uh, of an, uh, an error by, by a 14-year-old <coughs> or a 13-year-old male or female that it's trying their best to referee with zero support, right? Mm. And then... They're going to leave the game, and we're at a situation now where it's critical, and I'm sure all around Australia for match officials. I'm right. seeing, I'm seeing it where, where, where you know my local association. You're probably seeing it in the Canterbury Association. And the thing that hurts me about the refereeing, the young referees, when they're starting off and they're 12, 13, 14, and when they're getting constantly abused, they're scarred. They will never referee again. You've actually lost that kid. He's not coming back. You can try as hard as you like. And that's a sad reality of the game as well. So absolutely, and and this is why it, it's important that, <coughs> that that those people making those key decisions don't forget about the referees because the game is going to progress with with the referees also um, at a higher level. So, for example, um, if, if if you don't have referees, there's issues with players and and, and the way they act because the, the game's not being policed. And these 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 match officials, male and female, need to be supported 100%. We'll go somewhere different. What have been the greatest moment or moment for you or moments for you in your career, Strive? Oh, Andy, there's, <clears throat> there's been plenty. I've been fortunate to go from grassroots in Wollongong. I was born and bred in Wollongong all the way to the elite level. Uh, you know, I was a FIFA referee, so refereeing some massive games, World Cup qualifiers, A-League, and we, we talk about the A-League when it first kicked off and Refereeing Sydney derbies or Melbourne derbies in 45,000 seater at Sydney Football Stadium was a huge buzz. So referees mm. are no different to players. You know, players, that's what they live for, those, those types of games where they walk out and they get the buzz. It's the same as a, as a referee. You know, you're refereeing in Japan, Japan versus Korea, massive derby in front of 60,000 in Tokyo, and, and you're refereeing the game. It's, it's a huge buzz. So, it, it's, um, yeah, there's, there's been... Plenty of highlights. Who's been the, the greatest player you've stood in the middle with? Oh, look, you, you cross that white line and every single player is the same. I know, I know it's hard to... I know that's hard to understand, but it's like a player when a player says, you know, they walk out of the dressing room and Good they switch on. Yeah. <laughs> say, typical ref. But, typical ref answer. Yeah. <laughs> but look, you know, I mean, you know, the Del Pieros and the Beckhams and, better, and, and some of these and some of these players that you, that you mix with, that you, that you see on TV, but... Also, I remember refereeing at a, at a Champions League game in, in Saudi Arabia, would you believe it? And my... You know what, mate? No, I'm not. Uh, you should have run for the federal election and started a football party. <laughs> <laughs> you would have got in. You would have got your facilities. It will be fully synthetic. Well, you can't help me out. Now, right? come back to that story. No, no, but look, look I, story. you talk about one play and I'll just leave on this. Um, I remember you, you spoke about world soccer back in the day and, um, you know, those shows. I, I grew up watching world soccer and all that. And, my, and then the Serie A show. And my favourite and my, my idol was uh, uh, Walter Zenga, right? And I remember doing a Champions League game in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, might have been Jenna or somewhere. And then um, a friend of mine who's, who's Italian from Adelaide, who was my assistant referee that travelled with me everywhere, he goes, have a look at the team sheet. And I had a look at the team sheet, I had a look right there. The coach was coach. Walter Zenga and couldn't believe it. This, this guy, my idol, and now I'm refereeing his team. So it was a pretty, 
pretty amazing story. Mate. Give me your autograph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and if you were no, me, no. You would, if you were me, you would have got a hundred selfies. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. David, what about you? What's the greatest moment or moments in in your football career? Uh, Obviously, mate, playing in a World Cups right up yeah, there. Yeah, the two, yeah, two thousand ten. That was that was pretty big. Um, probably unfortunate not to go through actually to or to the next stage. Mm. But uh, one that sort of I've actually when I thought I really made it was so I was at FC twenty in Holland with mm. Steve McLaren. And um, uh, they won the league that year, so everyone was getting picked up to go anywhere, everywhere else and that. And Blackpool just got promoted to the Prem, and Ian Holloway was there. And my agent had something to do with the club a little bit in ways, and they needed someone on the left side. And and then obviously when I went there, I went there, and about five days later, I went there just as the season started, actually, because it was right at the end of the transfer window. It was pretty much the last day I signed. And then five days later, last half an hour, he was threw me on at Upton Park at, against Newcastle and that's when I sort of like got tingles and goosebumps running on so I always remember them sort of moments you know and that's oh, what absolutely. I thought that's when I thought I made it like that when I made it sadly, when I played against sadly, them sadly Blackpool I think got relegated that we season we got relegated against United last game but we beat Newcastle 2-0 that day so it was good <laughs> but you know here's a trivia question a trivia question for your pub quizzes how many Australians have actually played in the English Premier League uh, I don't know I'm just Putting it out there. Be interesting. Be over 10, I think. Oh, easily, <laughs> easily. If you look at that golden generation, you know, you think of your Craig Moores, your Vadukas, your Lazaridis, your Jules, um, Grella, Black, uh, Emerton at Blackburn, and, and, yeah, and it, uh, you, you'll yeah. be getting up to the 20s. Cat, you've had a few highlights, mate, a few NSL trophies to the cabinet at, uh, at home? Well, I've got two of my coaches here, uh, Rally in 87 and Bertie Mariani, 88, 89 of course, championships. Of course, of course. Good to see you, boys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, uh, there's been many highlights. I mean, uh, 82 Australian Player of the Year, uh, playing against England. How uh, old were you then? Because that was a, a magic uh, moment. 20, 21. 21, that's big. Uh, you know, winning, you know, Des Martin, I think he scored 40 goals that year. Yeah, he's... So to tip Des, uh, it was a big feat. But then, you know, 83, we played against England. Cricket ground, you know, man of the match. Bobby Robson interview. Mm. Uh, soccer appearances, uh, 20 years professional. Mate, I can go on and on. <laughs> but it's been great. You did, well, you did very well. Angelica, you're only relatively young. <laughs> Clearly younger than all of us out here. <laughs> You've had a few highlights already. But I would think that being picked... By the Tim Kale. Was that the Foxtel Academy? How old were it you was, then? I was 14 years old. It was in... Were you that tall? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did they think yeah. you were the goalkeeper? Oh, you know what? You know what the funny thing is? I always get that. And whenever Wait I a second. On let's it, just, let's just right. show you We're how tall. This. Angelica, hello there. <laughs> I'm attached come, to the. You're gonna oh, come I'll come to, to you. <laughs> It's, all right. it's like it's, okay. it's like twins, Danny DeVito <laughs> and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so, what position do you play? So it depends what mood my coach is in, um, but I'll either be centre-back or just to shake things up, I'll go up a striker and fluke in a little goal. Trevor's <laughs> talking about refereeing. You re you're a qualified ref as well. What yeah. have you seen that's really, really peeved you off? Ah, uh, ooh, the, okay. The worst, the worst scenario that you've... Which one? <laughs> oh, no, that many. Um, I think one of the, the ones that irked me the most, I think I was 15 years old, mm. Mm. and I got um, allocated yeah. to our all-age men's, and I was centre refereeing. And now, of course, being this height, I look like a 22-year-old. And um, I remember making a call, and I called a penalty, and I was so sure of it. I knew it. It was it. Like, my ego told me that was right. And I was. I was actually right. And um, so I called it. And uh, I think one of the guys turned around and said, no, 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 don't listen to her. She's not, she's a woman. What would she know? Oh, no. And, and it was right in front of my face too. And uh, very bravely, I turned around and gave him the yellow and off he went. So that shut them up. But uh, uh, another one that I have experienced was, uh, this was a fun one. I was AR and I was just a referee. And uh, again, looked like a 22-year-old and uh, called an offside. Again, offsides were my thing. I could get offsides. <laughs> Very offside, this guy, and uh, turns around and pulls down his pants. And oh my goodness, I've never seen something hairier in my life. Um, but this yes, is not SBS was, at the moment. I left is... SBS <laughs> in 1994. So that was that was definitely that's definitely up there. As How well. many weeks did he get? Oh, 
the best part is when I turned around and said, congratulations, you just moved an underage uh, girl. I was 16 at the time. Oh, and no. So he, well, like this ben. was senior men. Like ben. Yeah. Like Ben. Like Ben. <laughs> and I was there for the, for the hearing and I, I stood my ground. I was so happy to see him. And you're still yeah. in so, the game. Yeah. And talk, yeah, yeah. I think, I think Andy, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a very, it's a very good point. And, um, that's, you know, that's unac actually, all jokes aside, that is unacceptable, unacceptable. behaviour. That player should have got a year at the very least. Absolutely. Make a statement. And sometimes associations are too damn soft on I, certain I, individuals. I, I, I agree. I, and, and, but the, the point that I want to make here is um, re regarding refereeing. And again, I put the referee hat on. Is um, <clears throat> Even at that young age when a lot of the young referees um, take refereeing on board about the 13, 14, 15 year, year old mark, they do that because for a bit of extra cash. And, and also, um, I think, in my opinion, that's a great time to get those kids to um, learn, uh, but also it gives them some life experience. Refereeing mm. gives you life experience. Mm. You know, the big words that Confident, you learn in school. Confidence. Well, confidence, management, mm. resilience, they're all the big words at school. Um, mm. And I approach a number of schools and, 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 and associations and federations to say that we should be rough, uh, rolling out refereeing programs at school, right? Mm. Because... They're all the big words at school. Refereeing teaches you that. It, also, from mm. a financial point of view, you get paid. Yeah. Right? So you yeah. know what you do with your money. So they're life experiences that you're teaching um, kids at year 10, year 11, year 12. They shouldn't be doing these. Mm. And then basically when they have school games and that, you have the referees. You take 5%, take 2% of those kids from schools that go on to become refereeing, uh, become referees and referee in the game. Sort of. OK, we'll change tack in the run home and what's in front of us right now as a, as a game, the obvious one, <coughs> Peru. It's been a, a wonderful, wonderful run since 2006 and all of us have memories. I was there with 120 people on a tour and to continue to qualify, it's just pivotal for the game. How do you see things happening against Peru and how important is it to qualify for a World Cup? Um, I mean, fr from from my point of view, it's 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 critical. It's critical to the game here in Australia because, you know, for that ninety minutes of football on on Tuesday morning, everyone in Australia is going to be watching that game. And I think James said it before. Um, if the, if you qualify, then everything comes on the back of that. Everyone hops on the coattails, mm. and and we get that sponsorship, we get that interest. But not only from. Uh, from from fans, but then local governments, state governments, federal governments hop on board, which is, you know, we're talking about lights for a facility, but this mm. it, it just goes across all those areas. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk over to these these two gentlemen because I just want to get a closer narrative. I've played for Australia once. It was a game of indoor football in 1984, <laughs> so I technically cannot polish your boots. <laughs> What does it mean to wear that green and gold shirt and wear that emblem right there? What does it mean? I was talking about you in the car today. I said, um, well, I can only go with the experience of the players that I play with, but it was you've got a bond like you wouldn't believe. Even when you, you see someone like, let's say, Bresh or Harry, whatever, the, you, you just got that connection because you remember walking out together, playing against whoever... So when you do the national anthem, it's just like, and then you're playing. It's you know you run through brick walls and you do anything for your for your country, and that's the way it should be. And, and I'm not sure, Pete. When I started in this game in 1983, this gentleman's father was a very good player with Auburn in the New South Wales State League. I'm not sure if we, you might have played against him. Well, I started back in 1977. So he um, was playing in '83 and '84 at Auburn, from memory. Your yeah, dad? I was just born then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, God, I still remember. How does that work, <laughs> Peter? That's a great summation of really, and this is what we all want for our Matilda, our, our female footballers, our male footballers, to reach the pinnacle. What does it mean? Look, you get a cap. Mine was 308. At the end of the day, how many people get to represent this country? It's numbered, okay? So all these millions of people that are living in this... It's a big honour. It's a huge honour. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to, to represent your country, it's a big thing, you know, especially the national team. And to play a World Cup is, you know, the ultimate goal. And my, my view on the game, uh, look, I think we can get through, 
But I think what uh, Rally we were discussing the other day, I think Arnie's got to sit down on the bench, not parade up and down, give him all the, you know, the, get all the players all hyped up. And the other thing is we need, um, we need to basically go forward. In my view, you can't sit back against Peru. They're technically, well, I think, probably a lot better. So we need to basically you know, push forward. That's my take on the, on the game. when you got the phone call, was it by telegram or was it by carrier pigeon? It was pigeon? by telegram. It was by telegram, actually. It was a telegram. <laughs> it was a telegram, yes. Back in the day, there's no mobile phones, mate. <laughs> I it was a joke. Was, <laughs> no, it wasn't a joke. <laughs> I didn't know either. <laughs> it was, sorry, Pete. Uh, just just one, one more point. Um, the, you know, Socceroos are playing for a spot in the World Cup. But don't forget, we also have a... Referee's team representing Australia in the World Cup. Absolutely. So Chris Beath and his team, in Ashley Beecham and Anton Sechin and um, Sean Evans, uh, will be, will be re- representing Australia. Don't worry, I'm going to vote for you the next. Thanks election. very much. That's good. <laughs> I appreciate it. But but I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's true. always but you know, it's always well, overlooked we, 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 because it's no, really it is. important, it, right? But you know what it is? It's a lack of media media coverage, principally. I mean, we've had a lot of great referees officiate, and I remember when, when I was at the Asian Cup commentating in uh, Jakarta in 2007, which was the trigger point for me to go to India. They, they saw me there. I spent a lot of time in Mark Shield. I didn't realise how good a referee he was outside of his country when you see him in those mm. conditions. Because people forget. They just assume, oh, it's all the same wherever you go. N- no, it's not. I, I, internationally, outside of these borders, you wear that FIFA tracksuit anywhere in the world and, and you're a celebrity, you're God. Um, that brand FIFA anywhere around the world is, is massive. And referees or match officials are highly respected anywhere in the world. Uh, sorry, all around the world. So, um, you know, it's also a great... I've got a question for you. I've got a question for yeah. you. How do some referees get it so wrong with VAR? <laughs> yeah, that's just... I knew well, that was coming. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good question. And basically, you know, being in that in, environment, it's completely different to refereeing, right? Because... Um, as a referee, you're making a decision, uh, correct decision or not correct decision, right? Um, but in the VAR box, it, it, it's quite different because you're saying, is it an absolute howler? So there's a lot of grey area of we, when you should get involved or you shouldn't get involved, right? That's the difficult thing because VAR is not there to re-referee the game. The referee is there to referee the game. They make a decision. In that split second, they make a decision. As a VAR... You need to determine, is that an absolute howler or not? So that's the grey area. And, and that's where the frustration is. And it's difficult, absolutely. But for me, I think the most important thing is education. I think it's been mentioned a couple yeah, of times true. tonight, is if you educate the public, um, you know, at all levels of the game, spectators, um, at grassroots, education is going to be able to help a lot of things with the, with, the, with the laws of the game and the rules. Because a lot of people and a lot of issues that become from, you know, Games and whatever is pe- people just don't understand the rules. That's that's the difficult it's, thing. And, and the rules tend to change a fair mm-hmm. bit too. So every year, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I'm lucky because John Parker gives me an updated rule book each season before mm-hmm. I go to India. If you want to talk to me about handball, I think we'll, we'll go to the next. <laughs> we'll go to the next no, no, we've got uh, the legend himself, Mr. Rally Rasik, who's been here all day. He wants to say, you've got a question or you want a statement? You want to make a statement? What's your preference here, Mr. Rasik? Football royalty. I just, I just want to say something that uh, whatever Graham Arnold and the boys who wear green and gold, best wishes on our behalf. Um, as young Carney said, when you hear the sound of the national anthem, nothing in the world can match that. And let's wish... Uh, Socceroos, irrespective if we are, we have, of course, different opinions, right? We are entitled to that. But that's our country, that's our anthem, that's our team. Let's wish them good luck against Peru from this room. Well said, Rally. And just closing comments, last comment from you, Angelica. We always say the best to last. Well... About about what? Because I can talk about anything. No, no, just about <laughs> everything you've been involved with because we've got 20 seconds to wrap up. Honestly, I'm so proud of where this, this country is going with football, with the girls, the boys, but particularly the girls. We've got 2023 next year, some huge things coming up for the girls. And I think 
women's football is now a movement, and it's and I can't wait. <laughs> Angelica, it's a perfect way to finish off. Thank you so much. Good luck in your future endeavours uh, with your studying sports management, majoring at Western Sydney University. Cat, always a pleasure to see you, my friend. Your we love our football. Imp- your imprint. Football is in our yeah. DNA. That's why we're here. Football. Your we imprint football. has always been there. David, you've played the game at the top level, represented your country, been a World Cup. Now you're taking the coaching journey. All the very best. Strebe, always a pleasure Thanks, to you. see you, my friend. Uh, hopefully we can get you some support in the Illawarra because football needs to consolidate its uh, its benchmark there. So Spot thanks on. again. Thanks for coming Thank up from the gong today, boys. Absolutely. Um, to all our guests today, to the uh, you know the hosts that were here earlier, Mike Tomolaris and George Taniki, and um, and on behalf of all, all the guests, and we just thank you for the engagement. You know, this is the third in what we hope will be an ongoing series from Harry Michaels OAM who has football running through his blood. Uh, he is a football tragic and a broadcast pioneer. Uh, on behalf of Harry and everyone at ARC Television Concepts, we thank you for joining us. We look forward to the next special when we look at our great game, the beautiful game, the world game, the only game.